Hello and welcome. I, of course, am Joe Magician. Welcome to another A Song of Ice and Fire Quarren stream. Um, this time we're going to continue on a little bit of character study. Last time we talked about House Dane before with uh, Chloe of Girls Gone Canon. Before that, Euron with poor Quentin of Nauticast. But today, you sort of, in A Song of Ice and Fire, you can't really throw a stone in the fandom without hearing about these gray characters. They're not quite all good. They're not quite all bad. You know, the half rotten onions, which, which part do you cut off? They exist in this gray moral morass that Gurm seems to revel in, except one character who is the truest of knights, I would say. The least rotten onion of all, Brienne of Tarth. Some would probably say she looked great in a white cloak with armor trimmed in white enamel and silver. You know, a very uh, strong look. I would say. <laughs> uh, Brienne is, of course, the best of all things. And joining me this fine afternoon to discuss all aspects of Brienne the Beauty is one of her greatest advocates, I would say. It is Lauren, a.k.a. Shakes of, um, wow, a.k.a. Shakespeare Thrones. Um, many of you may remember from my post-episode live streams during Game of Thrones Season 8 that Lauren joined me, including after the bells when we had a breakdown on stream. That was fun. <laughs> we sure did. And the Halloween stream uh, on Three Witches that we did with San Rixian. That was also a blast. And, of course... Um, singing Jenny's song on my video about that song itself. Oh, I did that too. That's true. So, you've been on quite a lot of my stuff, Lauren, <laughs> but it's been yeah, a while. Yeah, it, we, we've had a history. It's good. <laughs> uh, so, hey, everybody. I'm uh, Shakes of Thrones, Shakespeare of Thrones. I feel like I originally kind of got my foot into the door in this fandom just by talking about Shakespeare and A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones and writing Shakespearean verse for um, Game of Thrones scenes. But the real reason why I wanted to make a name for myself is just so I could talk about Brienne. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, that was really the only motivation. Like all the Shakespeare stuff, it, it's kind of incidental. It's, I, I'm really a Brienne stan first and foremost. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> Talking about, you know, Stannis in terms of Macbeth, that was actually just a clever way to get people to listen to you about Brienne. <laughs> it, it's all been leading up to this. <laughs> <laughs> well... Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. I try to trick people to listen to my theories, too, mostly to talk about the Danes and the Strongs. Even when I'm talking about other things, that's just kind of how it goes. Um, mm -hmm. So, as many of you may know, our beloved Brienne, she fell in the finals of the Song of Madness tournament, uh, the yearly fake character bracketology. That is a really hard word that I typed out. Bracketology tournament put on by Matt and Scat of Davos's Fingers podcast. She made it all the way through and fell to Brienne, I mean, fell to Daenerys and her many, many Amelia Clark stands. Mm -hmm. Just a It was a good fight, them. though. It I was, I was happy fight. to see her rise that far. I was very happy for it. <laughs> she actually came pretty close, though. I mean, like, percentage-wise. She lost 54.4 yeah. to 45.6, but she got a total of 5,436 votes, which I don't think a lot of people going in, going into it really think that Brienne would be even that much of a fight for Daenerys, especially because mm -hmm. in years past, they've mostly been, um, it's largely been a member of House Stark versus Davos in the end, and then, mm -hmm. and then the Starks win. This time went completely off the rails. Um, and as we were getting into it, there was quite a lot of people being like, where is the support for Brienne coming from? Like, who cares this much about Brienne of Tarth? <laughs> it's me making all it's my puppet accounts. It's all of the fake <laughs> accounts. All me. <laughs> shakes is the bot. <laughs> Little did everyone know, she's actually a uh, stunning manipulator of Twitter. <laughs> you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know it. Um, and I think a lot of part of that problem is that we don't really hear from her inside her head until A Feast for Crows, which has the mm -hmm. reputation of being um, a lot of people's least favorite book. And they consider it sort of slow and boring, unfairly. Honestly, Un it's my favorite book. Unfair. I love A yeah. Feast for Crows. <laughs> so I thought today we would dispel that. We would tell you why Brienne is the best, why she deserved to get that far into that tournament, and where all this love and support comes from when it's not Shakes botting the results. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> when and it's not just me. When it's not, like I said, not just her. This is all a front. This Shakespeare thing is all a front so that I can just <laughs> support of my girl Brienne. Brienne, Brienne, Brienne of Thrones. <laughs> you and uh, right. Beauty Brienne. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. The true ship. Um, so we picked a quote here and it does a really good job of summarizing her character and how she feels about herself and her journey. And because it's, of course, Shakespeare's Stan. <laughs> yeah, this is go. a quote from uh, my favorite Brienne chapter, I believe, Brienne 6 at Quiet Isle, when she's talking to the elder brother. Mm -hmm. A daughter, Brienne's eyes filled with tears. He deserves that. A daughter who could sing to him and grace his hall and bear him grandsons. He deserves a son, too. A strong and gallant son to bring honor to his name. Galadin drowned when I was four and he was eight. And Alisan and Arianne died still in the cradle. I am the only child the gods let him keep. The freakish one, not fit to be a son or daughter. All of it came pouring out of Brienne then, like black blood from a wound. The betrayals and betrothals, Red Ronnet and his rose, Lord Renly dancing with her, the wager for her maidenhead, the bitter tears she shed the night her king wed Marjorie Tyrell, the melee at Bitterbridge, the rainbow cloak that she had been so proud of, the shadow in the king's pavilion, Renly dying in her arms, River Run and Lady Catelyn, the voyage down the trident, trident dueling Jamie in the woods, the bloody mummers, Jamie crying sapphires, Jamie in the tub at Harrenhal with steam rising from his body, the taste of Vargo Hote's blood when she bit down on his ear, the bear pit, Jamie leaping down onto the sand, the long ride to King's Landing, Sansa Stark, the vow she'd sworn to Jamie, the vow she'd sworn to Lady Catelyn, Oathkeeper, Duskendale, Maidenpool, Nimble Dick, and Crackclaw, and the whispers, the men she'd killed. I have to find her, she finished. There are others looking, all wanting to capture her and sell her to the Queen. I have to find her first. I promised Jamie, Oathkeeper, he named the sword. I have to try to save her or die in the attempt. That is... <sighs> That is some brutal quotes. Um, it's just like a summary of all that she's been through. She's really been through a lot. <laughs> this has been a wild ride from Brienne of Tarth, from that little island of sapphires. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm like eating breakfast while we're doing the frame because mm -hmm, it's actually a little bit early still here on the West Coast, but for so, Saturday. <laughs> so I forgot not everybody lives on the East Coast. <laughs> That is not 1.13 in the afternoon. For some people, it's early morning. Early morning, 10.13. Early morning. That's very early. Roosters are still crowing. I don't hear any roosters. Anyway. It's late in the back, day. Anyway. <laughs> back to the idyllic Isle of Tarth. Back to the idyllic Isle of Tarth. Um, the funny thing about Tarth is, is that we don't actually know a whole lot about it. Mm -hmm. Like, relative to other characters whose POVs we experience, I... I feel like we um, actually know more about their their backstory and their houses. We don't even have Tarth House words, no. um, but but there are some things that we do know about Tarth that that come out uh, slowly in in Brienne's chapters. Um, so it's off the we we know from the map. It's off the eastern coast of the Stormlands. It's peace. It's people trace their lineage back to a legendary hero uh, called Sir Galadin of Morn who is probably a historical figure. Um, and there's some myth and legend surrounding him and uh, a sword given to him by the maiden herself. <gasps> and Amazing. that sword was called the Just Maid, which is you know clearly a parallel for Oathkeeper and, mm -hmm. and Jamie and all of that, but also has some cool like thematic stuff underlying it. Um, which I'm excited to talk about later with you. I see that <laughs> later in the notes. Um, <clears throat> so there are some other like little random things that we know about Tarth. Like it, it seems like marble is an important export. The Erie is constructed from it. Um, the Western shore provides good shelter for ships against storms that rage across the narrow sea. Uh, Avonfall Hall is the seat of Tarth and the lords who were once kings in their own right have historically styled themselves as the Avonstar. Mm. Which is a really interesting, interesting reference, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's like it, it seems like it's 
Tarth is kind of imported from Lord of the Rings almost in some ways, or I don't know, just like some other world, just with um, this level of legendary detail that we we get about it. And and the Avon Star is in particularly is in particular um, a link to LOTR. I feel like yeah, it's um, the Avon Star is um, the nickname for Arwen. God, I can never pronounce these names. Und- Domiel, basically the daughter of Elrond, the um, wife of Aragorn, um, Mm -hmm. often called Evenstar. And that kind of tells you a little bit about what you need to know about Tarth and the people that live there. It does sort of feel like this like hidden elven kingdom in a way. The names and the the symbols that they have about them, the sun and the moon, even the name like Evenstar and Evenfall. These are all, a lot of times in Lord of the Rings, the elves associate themselves with the moon a lot more than sun. Like the, mm-hmm. the humans are the sun people, the elves are the moon people, largely because they, when they were born, there was no sun and moon and they were born in twilight, basically. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot that goes into it. But much like we were talking about last week with House Dane and the falling star and all this incredible mythical lineage that you can get from them, this is also telling you quite a lot about how people how you're supposed to view Tarth and how people kind of view Brienne for being from there. She's Mm -hmm. from this weird other magical world so much so that apparently you can just trick people into thinking it's full of sapphires. Like that's a thing you can do. It's an, (laughs) it's an, it's an entire Island of sapphires that is so rich that you've never heard of it, but also full of precious gems. It's, it's that mm-hmm. kind of place. It it tells you that much like um, sort of like the veil and like I was talking about Danes, Brienne is coming from a high fantasy. Um, what's the right word for it? Like window dressing. That that's mm-hmm. how you're supposed to understand where she's coming from. And and then we have Brienne, who is who she is and what she looks like coming from this beautiful. Um, semi i mean not i I don't want to say magical but it it sounds like it has those undertones like Mm -hmm. what you were talking about and and she definitely does not look like she could come out (laughs) of a world like that she's not elven not even a little (laughs) no no not not even a little bit but she is very good she is very good (laughs) uh so yeah go ahead I was just going to say, there's another reference here. Um, the Even Star is also the name of a ship in um, a older but uh, prominent fantasy series called Wars, Wars of Light and Shadow by the author Janie Wirtz. Um, it's very likely that George may have borrowed some of the names and some of the ideas from that story, as he does with other things, especially because she even gave a, uh, a review that ended up in one of the Feast for Crows uh, covers where she said it was few created worlds are as imaginative and as diverse complimenting george so it may mm. be a reference to lord of the rings it may also be a reference to other authors like he often does like for instance house jordan is for robert jordan that kind of mm. stuff happens all the time yeah right yeah and um i i think that even the name tarth is is really interesting um because somebody pointed out i can't remember what for maybe several people found it at the same time but tarth means mist Oh, in Welsh. Hmm. So um, I don't know. I don't know if that's intentional or if it just happens to mean something in Welsh. But mm. I don't know. I can almost kind of imagine that because, like, like we said, there are so many things that we 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 don't know about Tarth. Like, I mean, the house words I mentioned, but also we don't know a whole lot about Brienne's mother nope. and her exact ancestry. We. Um, know that she is a a descendant of Sir Duncan the Tall, but not whether it's on her mother's side or her father's side. There's also uh, this little blurb in um, A World of Ice and Fire, which says that their lineage traces to the Durandans, the Baratheons, and more recently, Targaryens. Hmm. (laughs) And it's like, wow, more recently, like how recently? (laughs) And, and, you know, how is like Brienne, how, how is House Tarth not more important than it is if they have some recent um, lineage that's traced back to Targaryens? You know what I mean? It's really um, curious. Which part of the Tar- was it a, a woman going into Targaryen house? Was it like, um, was it a Targaryen female being married into House Tarth itself? That part, probably not that one. That one's much more rare. The Targaryens tended not to. Um, mm 
marry out their daughters too much. They kind of prefer to marry them themselves, to put it Ooh. as gross as it is. Yeah, I, I have ideas myself, but I feel like, you know, we can we can like save that for uh, tinfoil time at the end of <laughs> the video. Time. If, if anybody wants to do tinfoil time with shakes, I um I, I do like some tinfoil myself. Mostly about Brienne. Know, I do. Mostly about Brienne. <laughs> Just if we're talking about Brienne. And then um, I thought we should go back to Galadon Amorn because he's a really interesting um, character for how Brienne uh, knows who he is and seemingly is trying to imitate this person. So he's a legendary hero of Tarth. Basically, few other people have heard of him. Sort of a local hero, kind of like with a uh, nimble dick and um, God, what's his name? What's what's the the legendary hero uh, that Nimble Dick loves? Oh, um, isn't it Sir Clarence? Clarence Crab, Crab that's it. Yeah, a, lo <laughs> a local hero with a magical sword that did incredible things. That sort of seems like what Galadon is like. He, like you said, he had his magical sword given him to given to him by the maiden herself because he was the perfect knight, the absolute <laughs> best in the world, and he only unsheathed it three times, but he could never <laughs> use it against people. Not against people. That'd be unfair. Right? It's too good a sword. He only used it yeah. to kill dragons, apparently. Yeah, so obviously it reminds us of Oathkeeper. Mm -hmm. And I love that Jamie is the one who gave Brienne Oathkeeper. So if you tie it back to the 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 legend, it's like Jamie is in the position of the maiden. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. That's funny. <laughs> and Brienne is the warrior. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of like Beauty and the Beast parallels going oh, on with, with that, too. Um, which we talk about later in this video, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that the Galadin uh, legend is just important to Brienne as a standalone character, because sometimes we forget that Brienne is a standalone <laughs> character. She's not just important, you know, in, in the scope of like Jamie and the other characters who surround her. She's her, she's her own person and has her own contributions to the story. And a lot of times I think that she's struggling so much between her masculine side and her feminine side. Hmm. And um, I wonder if like the just maid is sort of a representation of that femininity. And if it's almost kind of like a subtle commentary that femininity is as important as masculinity, but so rarely used. Oh, that's um, a good point. I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of like a not fully fleshed out idea that I have. But maybe it could also just be talking about the power of, you know, love. And it's something like how it can't, I don't know, it's something so powerful that it can't be used too often. Um, kind of like how Lily Potter protected Harry with her love against Voldemort. Yes, sort of perfect. Harry Potter reference we're in. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody else has any ideas about the Just Maid and, uh, you know, thematics and symbology related to that um i think i, I think it's exciting to consider it, about it i also think it's an important story for brienne because a lot of times when we hear about these uh heroic characters um their background or why they're incredible is usually sort of this like self-made person um just like an incredible hero they're strong they're tough and they just go around kicking everybody's ass but that's not galadon i mean he's a perfect knight but the reason he's so amazing is this magical sword which is given to him by the maiden so mm -hmm. it's a it's in a way it's femininity giving somebody incredibly strong their power mm -hmm. yeah somebody uh in the chat mallory simmons just made a point that maybe uh brienne will use Oathkeeper to kill lady stoneheart who is not oh. that's an exciting um idea that is a big question about where that's gonna yeah. go <laughs> we, we do have some ideas about where brienne will go in her arc later on so we'll definitely get to those uh, one more thing i wanted to bring up about um galadin of morn is is how brienne must feel like really i don't know not not pressured necessarily but i think that she she does see herself as a sort of um, reflection of him mm -hmm. and um She's like trying to live up to this ideal of the perfect knight, not just because she wants to be the perfect knight, but also because we know that her her siblings all died, and her um her only brother, her elder brother, was named Galadin. Yeah, <laughs> so he was named after Galadin of Morn, the perfect knight. And Brienne has she mentioned several times in her chapters that uh, she kind of feels bad that she was the only child that 
the gods let her father keep and that she couldn't be, um, you know, enough of a daughter, enough of a son for him. And it, she's just like trying to live up to this ideal, which is so difficult in the first place because he's a perfect knight. But also because Brienne has so many things that are working against for her, just for, for how society sees her. Mm. And uh, I feel for her so much. <laughs> she's trying so hard yeah there's a there's an impossible standard that she's being held up to she has to right. and it's a, a standard that in some ways she will never be able to reach it's she can never be the yeah like you're saying she can never be the son that someone wants he can also never be the daughter she he wants to um and that comes up where she cut kind of, her upbringing is kind of split both ways where on one hand he does give her to um sir goodwin who trains her as a fighter but then mm -hmm. she also is given over to septa roel who's mm -hmm. trying to train her as a lady and he's still trying to marry her off while also trying to turn her into a warrior and it seems that a lot of her confusion about her identity and where she fits into the world kind of comes from that, where someone isn't really sure what to do with her, where he's like, well, this is her natural talent. This is what she's great at. Shouldn't I make her a knight? And it's like, well, I'm going to be handicap handicapping her doing that. Okay, well, I'll turn her all the way into just being like uh, a daughter I can marry off and be a good lady. It's like, well, that's not her personality. She'd be terrible at that, too. So what do you do with her? And he, yeah, he went both yeah, ways. <laughs> She's had all these mentors and parental figures in her life who've been so confused about how to raise her and what to do with her. How is this girl going to fit into society? And she still like carries that with her. It's amazing that Brienne is as tender hearted as she yeah. is. Still, Cause she's had some, man, she's had some like really shit luck with, I mean, okay. I mean, Selwyn, like Lord Selwyn is definitely like, he's actually pretty good as far as fathers in mm -hmm. Westeros go. I mean, I still don't think that he gets Father of the Year award because, no. I mean, he tried to arrange these awful, awful marriages for her. And I don't know. I, I kind of imagine, like, that it was a concession to her at long last that she could fight and train. Like, he really tried to get her to fit into the mold and... Um, finally allowed her to train as a warrior. Whereas when you think about Ned, he's like, okay, you want to learn how to sword fight? Yeah. Here's your dancing master. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I, I don't know. Selwyn is, is definitely not, I would even say as bad. He's, he's pretty good relative to other fathers, but I still think that Brienne got a lot of confusion um, growing up from his own confusion for like, how what to do with her put her in a dress or give yeah. her a sword what do we do here nanari is, is a great comparison very very similar ideas where he doesn't he, <laughs> he doesn't know what to do with his daughter mm -hmm. same sort of thing and there's actually a really good quote here from um sir goodwin one of the things brienne remembers and that she remembers this entire speech line by line tells you how much that it meant to her when it was sent and how much it really informs her it says sir goodwin said you have a man's strength in your arms, Sir Goodwin had said to her more than once. We are hard as it's soft as any maid's. It is one thing to train the yard with blunted with a blunted sword in hand, and another to drive the foot of sharpened steel into a man's gut and see the light go out of his eyes. To toughen her, Sir Goodwin had used used to send her to the father's butcher to slaughter lambs and suckling pigs. The piglets squealed and the lambs screamed like frightened children. By the time the butchering was done, Brienne had been blind with tears her clothes so bloody that she had given them to the to her maid to burn. But Sir Goodwin still had doubts. A piglet is a piglet. It is different with a man. And like we were talking about with her tender heart, even if you send her down this path, like, okay, you're going to be a warrior, you're going to be a soldier, you're going to be a knight kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's not enough to be a tourney knight. Like, you have to be able to really do it. And that's what Sir Goodwin is trying to do for her. And even that is going against... It's like her outward her outward skills don't always match her inner desires. There's on the outside she's Arya, uh, but on the inside there's a lot a lot more Sansa to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Sir Goodwin goes on to tell her about like this friend that he had in battle who flinched before he tried to kill somebody, and that moment that one moment was all that it took, um, and his friend was was killed because of that moment moment's hesitation and Brienne thinks about that moment and 
keeps wondering, will I be good enough? Will I not be able to flinch? Will I really be able to do it? Like she doesn't even know herself. Um, so it's, it's an incredible amount of pressure <laughs> to, to know that like all this training that you've done your whole life, the one thing you, you think you're suitable for, <laughs> and it all depends on one moment. And um, we know that she is able to do it, but like you said, she, she still does have like this uh, tender hearted uh, spirit like Sansa. She and Sansa have so much in common, actually, which I think we're going to talk to talk about a little bit later here, or should we get into it? Yeah, now? you go ahead. This was this was your thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, what I find particularly interesting as we start Brienne's narrative journey and um, A Feast for Crows is her relationship to Sansa, who she's never even met and yet is bound to by oath. Um, Brienne is seen as ugly by society and freakish and she keeps repeating like a mantra um i'm looking for a beautiful girl highborn girl of three and ten blue eyes and auburn hair and um they're outwardly different but so similar inside even as she repeat even as she says this to people they're like oh well she's probably not a maid anymore ha mm -hmm. ha and brienne gets rape threats herself a all the time. time all <laughs> the time nonstop. <laughs> right um but like in spirit like in in story they both seem like fairy tale princess tropes to me like they're, they're kind of like a deconstruction of that fairy tale princess and mm -hmm. i think we talk about that in uh regards to sansa more than we do brienne but you know for sansa it's obviously like she has all these conceptions of what her life is going to be like you know marry the prince become a queen happily ever after, blah, blah, blah. And that obviously doesn't happen. Um, Brienne has kind of confronted that a lot earlier on and kind of taken her own path. She's kind of more like the Mulan um, mm -hmm. <laughs> princess yeah. story where she's carving her own, own path. But I don't know. I think that they're both in search of the same thing, uh, this sort of lost innocence um brianne seems to put herself in sansa's mind all the time like guessing where she is and where she's going <laughs> what would i be doing if i were sansa like right now it, it's almost like brianne is trying to warg into sansa <laughs> to try and figure out where she's going and to like it, it's like brianne is in search of herself a little bit so i find that really interesting because brianne has all these trust issues and whether she can regain trust in people and um trust that there are good men and good people <laughs> out there. I, I feel like th that's really going to be what determines whether Brienne takes a darker path, if she loses all that trust, or mm -hmm. if she, um, if, if her story ends up, you know, I, I wouldn't say ha having a happy ending, <laughs> but you know, having a not so dark ending conclusion. Yeah, there's, um, and one, uh, direct comparison that Sansa and Brienne have is their history of terrible, terrible betrothals and marriages. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, well, actually, the first one wasn't that bad. Um, uh, Brienne was betrothed to a young Lord Byron Karen, who unfortunately got a chill croaks. Yeah. But it was uh, right within the time when they would have been married. So it. Apparently this, they were going to go through with this one. The Karens were like, all right. I mean, like Brand's not the prettiest. She's kind of weird, but you know, it's the Taurus. She was like six at the time too. Yeah. Like that was the betrothal and she was super young. I mean. <laughs> so she grew up thinking that was going to be her future, that uh, her yeah. and Karen were going to be, no matter what, her and Byron Karen were going to be the, the real deal. Didn't end up mm -hmm. happening. Uh, you can see that with Sansa where she dreamed of um, marrying, uh, not a, S somewhat Joffrey, but just sort of a the idea that she would mar marry and be someone's um, good wife sort of thing for quite a long time in her life before, you know, gets snatched away. Second one was way more cruel. We have a uh, Red Ronnet Connington. Um, it's unclear why he even took the betrothal. He shows up with a rose and gives it to Brienne and says, this will all you'll have from me. And then breaks it immediately because I guess he thought she was way too ugly and weird for him to marry. 
he saw her and he's like, deal's, deal's done. We're out. Um, it was probably the sort of marriage where Connington took it because he was hoping to uh, rise higher. We know that in front of him, there was actually John Connington, who eventually got exiled um, for his role in the um, in Ares's, um Yeah. In, in the Robert's Rebellion. And Ron, it was like a second son, so it's not like he would have inter- inherited his... Um, he was going to inherit his father's lands and everything, but Brienne is the only child yeah. of Selwyn. I mean, she's got all of Tarth, and whoever marries her... Oh, well, I don't know if they would be the Avonstar, but I don't know. Probably, given how fucked up things are in Westeros. They could have acted <laughs> as the Lord, even if they their children probably would have been Tarths. Or whatever mm-hmm. their last name is. That's the weird part. Brienne does her like her house is of Tarth. She's always mm-hmm. called Brienne of Tarth. Is she Bren Tarth? Well, no, that's the mm-hmm. island. I, no, I think she is. Just nobody calls her that. Like they they call her father Lord Selwyn Tarth. Yeah, and not Lord Selwyn of Tarth. So yeah. I don't know. I almost wonder. Maybe you have to be the even star to be <laughs> to be <laughs> to the Tarth, the Ned, the that kind star. of thing, the Stark. Um, so that one blows up. Um, at that point, Selwyn, I'm pretty sure at that point, all of his other children are dead. And mm-hmm. so he's got to do something. And he tries Sir Humphrey Wagstaff. And he is not a nice guy. He shows up and tells Brienne that um, we are going to get married and you're going to live the way I tell you. You're going to give up all this fighting crap. You're going to give up um, all the things you're good at. And you're going to be... Make me sandwiches, bitch. Yeah, basically that kind of guy. <laughs> Brienne throws it back in his face and says that she will only marry somebody that could beat her in combat. Unfortunately, um, Humphrey has challenged Brienne of Tarth to combat. To combat, so he breaks three bones. Betrothal's oval is over. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in in the same in a similar way to Sansa, um, a lot of these marriages are breaking up very quickly, very young, and it's kind of putting this. Um, the stain in her mind about what is it? What is even the point of this? Like, am I anything more than just Selwyn Tarth's daughter? Am I anything mm-hmm. more than just the key to the North? Like Sansa feels sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and it's no wonder that like she has this attachment to Renly. Yes. Um, and he comes to Tarth during a progress to meet his subjects in the Stormlands, and her father hosts like. Um, a ball for her and and one last Renly. shot yeah i know who knows like maybe, maybe her father thought "Ooh, maybe i can get renly for happy you marry. know it's not a bad chance imagine how excited right. selling would it be when he saw renly baratheon dancing with bran of tarth oh man he must have been um i i, I bet loris was already in the picture then though oh yeah There's, <laughs> there was no chance but um oh, of course but it means something very and, different for Brienne, obviously. Yeah, I think that Renly would have married higher up anyway. Like, mm. I don't know. Tarth is is a, is a nice prize, but for Baratheons, they, they probably would have had their sights set a bit higher. But still, I mean, Brienne didn't care about any of that. It's just that Renly danced with her and showed her courtesy and was kind to her. And God, she just gets so little of that in her life. And this was like the first person that she felt who was kind to her and probably who she felt that she could trust and Mm -hmm. um and love with yeah yeah and so it's it's no wonder that like she just wants to follow him and serve him (laughs) when she can it's like she turned 18 and she's like i am off to serve renly it's like (laughs) yeah you can do stuff around tarth you could be like the lady of tarth you could learn these things she's like "Uh uh-uh out of the house i'm going i'm following my boyfriend (laughs) Yeah, like, her okay. bae. She's talking his Instagram, uh, and there's a quote here that I think says a lot about um, really how much Renly Baratheon means to her, which um, is actually kind of funny. The Nauticast guys are going through Renly and Stannis right now, and they're pointing out the flaws in his character and how he really doesn't seem like a genuine person, but for maybe the most genuine person in A Song of Ice and Fire, this guy means everything to her. And it, it's mm-hmm. an interesting way that George wrote that in... Um, this is not this is he is not Galadon of Morn, but in Bran's mind he kind of is. He's sort of this legendary uh wonderful figure for her. And uh here 
The quote is, Renly Baratheon had been more than a king to her. She had loved him since he first came to Tarth on his leisurely Lord's Progress to mark his coming of age. Like we were talking about, that probably means Tar Lord Selwyn was like, ooh, may you get a marriage here. Her father welcomed him with a feast and commanded her to attend. Elsewise, she would have hidden in her room like some wounded beast. She had been no older than Sansa, more afraid of sniggers than of swords. They will know about the rose, she told Lord Selwyn. They will laugh at me. But the even star would not relent. And Renly Baratheon had showed her every courtesy as if she were a proper maid and pretty. He even danced with her, and in his arms she'd felt graceful, and her feet had floated across the floor. Later others begged a dance of her because of his example. From that day forth, she wanted only to be close to Lord Renly, to serve him and protect him. But in the end she failed him. Renly died in my arms, but I did not kill him, she thought. But these hedge knights would never understand. I would have given my life for King Renly and died happy, she said. I did no harm to him. I swear it by my sword. Mm. That is a lot of love. That is a huge amount of love. For a character that we make a lot of fun of, too. Yeah. In the fandom. I mean, in general, um, I don't know. I, I feel like, especially if, if you're not a cast fan, mm -hmm. you, you hear a lot of shit about Renly. Yeah. And rightfully so. He's kind of a dick. But to Brienne... Man, I, I have a lot of love for, for Renly just because of the kindness that he showed Brienne and for the love that she has for him, too. Like, I'm so glad that she was able to experience that for somebody. I almost wonder if Renly hadn't been a thing in her life, if she would have experienced like that feeling for anybody and if she would have like grown up jaded and kind of more, um, I don't know, less tender than she is. Mm. She really because she does. wouldn't have known what in love. She really does hold on to this as like the one good memory in her life. That night with Renly, when everybody was treating her like she was normal, she was no longer the outsider. It's it, it. She's trying to sort of get back to that in a way the rest of her life, or at least in service of that one nice time. And also, uh, the part she really internalizes from this is that she considers Renly dancing with her as a protection, that he was mm -hmm. um, standing up to the bullies, standing up to the people that made fun of her, and she does that the rest of her life. She really takes the example here, because, I mean, she's being trained to be a soldier, she's being trained how to kill, she could have been a mercenary, she could have been um, something more like Pretty Maris, like... We'll, yeah. talk, we'll talk to a little bit, but instead she wants to be the shield for the defenseless. And a lot of that comes back to this example from Nunley, which is ironic mm. because as we learned from Loris, um, feelings were not reciprocated between <laughs> Renly and, um, and Brienne. Although we can't kind of for her sword mm -hmm. and, and how she would protect him at all costs. But to her, he was protecting her. <laughs> Yeah, mostly it's not even clear why he did it. Uh, he might have thought it was just like a way to show off for the other lords to get them to see if he could get them to do what he was doing. I like to think that Renly's a human being Somewhat. and had an actual moment. I don't know. Like I, in my head, like Renly knew that he was different, of course, because uh, he's gay mm -hmm. in a very... Um, heteronormative society and he saw Brienne being different, like, being different, but so like, she can't hide it, mm. you know, she looks so different. And I think that he really, I like to think that he just had a moment of deep empathy for her and kind of projected himself onto her a little bit and just wanted to, wanted to show her courtesy and kindness. That's the other part that, of That's this. what I like we can't really it's hard to believe what loris is saying because he hates brienne <laughs> um <laughs> loris got defeated by brienne in the melee at bitterbridge to be to join her rainbow guard to join renly's rainbow guard and also loris believes that brienne killed renly so what he is saying may not be the whole truth it may be his interpretation of what he heard from renly it, it just keep that in mind that Renly may not have been the terrible, awful person that Loris is presenting, that he laughed at her at every opportunity. Loris is not a reliable POV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
And also, I mean, both of them were in love with Renly. So in a way, he probably saw her as a romantic uh, rival in mm -hmm. a weird way. <laughs> in a very weird way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and she and him, like she bested him in a main way. So it kind of feels like, ooh, is she going to best me at protecting my sweetie now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the problematic fave of Loris and Brienne, yeah. Renly Baratheon. I'm very problematic. <laughs> but she does carry out this pattern the rest of her way through the books. Um, she protects the orphans when we see her in A Feast for Crows. She's extremely protective of Podrick, even though she doesn't really like him. Even the same for Nimble Dick, where she kind of thinks he's not well suited to kind of what they're doing. Um, when she's searching for the Stark girls, she's trying to repay, repay the kindness that was shown to her once. She wants to be their Renly, sort of. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in the um, fall in love with way, just somebody with power and strength using it for those that need it. Yeah, and it, it's like children, um, she, she's, she really wants to protect anybody who's younger and smaller and weaker than she is like that's automatically somebody that she, she doesn't have to worry about trust issues with mm -hmm. but any, anybody who's like a grown man <laughs> she she does have to like she's constantly like wondering Dude, can i trust this person answer is no so, usually <laughs> the answer is usually no and so i i think that she's absolutely right and being suspicious and mistrustful but it's not her nature because she really does want to protect and um and and to sort of just safeguard innocence like i mean i i love look i i watched the show first and oh god i love gwendolyn christie's portrayal of Brian. it's so good but um I, I always like wince when she treats Podrick so badly <laughs> <laughs> for so long because in 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 Feast, Brienne meets Pod and she just sees him stammering and you know trying to do his best and following her and her heart like goes out to him. She just mm -hmm. feels like the surge of tenderness for this poor skinny ten year old or twelve year old. Is he? 12? He's pretty young. Well, yeah. Um, and I don't know. The thing is, is that I, 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 I appreciate how the show took it as, you know, her like just trying to put up her defenses and not be vulnerable to anybody. And plus, Pod is quite a bit older in the show. Yes. But I don't know. It, it's also like so warming to see those displays of affection and recognition of affection in the books from Brienne. Hmm. Uh, while we're talking about the show briefly, I think that's one of the big differences is that if you're just a show watcher, um, you get Gwendolyn Christie, who is, they try very, very hard, but she is an incredibly beautiful woman. Brienne in the books so is a train wreck. Um, she is described as maybe one of the ugliest characters in there. And that really, um, informs a lot of her decisions the way she treats people the way she lacks trust is because she's used to people um seeing her as just an ugly face rather than the good person she is underneath yeah yeah and i i mean like in in the show that there are a lot of other differences in personality um too she's much more brusque in the show i think she's like closer to pretty Maris sort mm. of personality in the show, but <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit. Um, and Brienne has this naivety in, in the books mm. that I think suits her uh, younger self. Cause she's like 19, 20 in the books and in the show it's like unclear, but mid thirties, probably whatever Gwendolyn Christie's age is in the show. But I don't know. Great, great adaptation, but I still love, um, book Brienne just a tiny bit more <laughs> just a tiny bit more uh yeah uh what we're gonna get on to next I think um we're gonna talk about her journey in the main books because we we really barely touched those so far we're kind of up to a clash of kings when Renly dies oh Renly dies that was weird um but take a, <clears throat> a brief break right here and do some uh some plugs tell people what's going on um are you working on anything shakes you working on any essays you working on any stuff for the fandom I'm actually 
not right now. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> not right now. <laughs> it's kind of been a weird time yeah. to say that. I, I have ideas of things that I want to do. Brienne? Um, no, nothing Brienne related. Actually, I, I guess I'm going to plug my Shakespeare obsession a little bit right now. I am a watching a lot of hamlet this month this mm-hmm. is a shakespeare birth month and so i'm watching in particular kenneth Branagh's hamlet and uh john webster and i are going to do a um stream about that oh. at some point so if you're into binging some shakespeare movies check out um Branagh's hamlet it's really really good so and i'll tweet about when that's going to be but Date is up in the air up as in of the right air. now. <laughs> At some point, I would like to write some Aswaf essays. Aswaf essays again. Thank you, Aswaf. That's the correct pronunciation. But, yes, and we're Aswaffles. Aswaffles. So this is correct. But you can check out the essays that I have written at ShakespeareThrones.com. Mm-hmm. I've talked about parallels between Ned Stark and Brutus of Julius Caesar and um, did I say a Julius Caesar? I think I said a. Julius. You might have. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> Ned Stark from A Game of Thrones and Brutus from Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. <laughs> and um, I also have an essay about Stannis and Macbeth <laughs> and uh, also uh, an essay about witches. Yes. And all their different glorious forms. In and how they show up in us. And, yep. and Macbeth primarily. <laughs> Mostly Macbeth. That's where the witches show yeah. up the most. Um <laughs> As for me, obviously, um, uh, like, subscribe, all the things if you're here watching for the first time. Uh, I also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Joe Magician, where you can get access to uh, videos early. You get access to thumbnails. Uh, if San Rixing makes an art for a video, it gets posted there for you guys. Get access to the Patreon Slack, um, which is basically like the, the chat that's going on right now. A lot of the same people there end up in the Slack just doing this all the time. It's great. Um, and uh, the script or the outline. So for instance, my patrons, I posted a link before we went live. They're following along as we're, uh, as we're talking. So they are comparing <laughs> how much we're <laughs> going off script as we're talking. <laughs> oh, well, that, that got shared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it got shared out. Um, and also, well, speaking of videos you can get early, as of, right, as of today, um, my Archmaester level patrons and above are able to watch my new video, which will be coming out tomorrow, talking about uh, Arya Stark and that coin she got from Jack and Hagar. And how exactly does the Faceless Men coin get get to Bravo system work? And kind of what does it tell you about what it's like to be a Faceless Man? And <clears throat> actually, George's other works, which was a surprising Ooh. connection I made. Um, the Glass Flower, one of his sci-fi stories. So that will be um, coming out tomorrow, but patrons as of today can go watch it early and listen to it early. Thanks guys, as always. Um, and I'm gonna continue doing these corn stream things, um, I guess for a while. Uh, <laughs> sat- for, sat- a while. Sat- for a while, because we're not going out. So I don't have much else to do on Saturday, I so. Not a fandom. <laughs> it has enhanced it. <laughs> People are finding all sorts of ways to be creative indoors. Apparently mine is streams and videos. But yeah, so next Saturday at 1 p.m. Um, it will probably be about the video that's coming out tomorrow, something about the Faceless Men with Arya. Um, so that'll be fun. Uh, look cool. for the video tomorrow. It will be going up as a premiere. I haven't set the time yet, but um, I'll make sure to drop it on social media and in the uh, description of the video if you're watching this later. So, plugs out of the way. Let's move on to... So, after Renly's death, this is a huge moment for her. It's it's one of those things that sort of gets glossed over because uh, a lot of the discussion about Renly's death is in terms of Stannis and how mm-hmm. he thinks about it later and the Shadow Babies and Melisandre's role. But for Brienne, this is maybe the most devastating moment of her life. Like she knows that she can never be Renly's lover. That's not going to happen. She He has married Marjorie Tyrell at this point. Um, but she has to watch the one person who has been kind to her, the one person that she's been falling around trying to 
be his shield against the world and sing his praises, literally die in his in her arms, and it just devastates her. And it's almost like her uh, kind of like radicalization moment, where she swears that she's gonna punish Stannis for this, and um, a lot of her her arc changes where she starts becoming more um, aggressive in what she's doing. It's not just protecting somebody; she's out questing in a way. Yeah, um, and she finds uh, someone new to trust, like a new person to look up to in Catelyn Stark. Uh, she's kind of like the mother that Brienne never had. So I think that that's like a really important figure for her in um, A Storm of Swords. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just like... <laughs> Really devastating what happens by the end of a feast for crows and that mother figure is just kind of turned like into this you know rotten opposite of nurturing mother <laughs> figure there is nothing good brienne's allowed to have everything has to turn awful on her <laughs> yeah it's um it's interesting that she ends up in catalan's service um she has no real connection to the to, to river run to the North to the Starks, Catelyn personally, it's basically just because um, after Renly is killed, um, she Brienne really doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, she can go back to Tarth, I guess, but if she wants to continue being the kind of hedge knight figure that she is, or joining some household, well, nobody likes her. <laughs> this is un this is the unfortunate part of her character. Brenly is basically the only one that was giving her a place in their. Um, in the um the martial world that she wants like and now she's known as the person who killed renly yeah. but cattle is like the only person to see her not kill renly to, to know that that's not true mm -hmm. no. and uh we know from catalan's pov that she has a lot of sympathy for brienne where mm -hmm. she sees not the giant hulking warrior woman who's incredibly ugly well, she does see those things, but she sees her as the, the, the quality person that she is and somebody that needs um, needs people in her life to do good things for her. She has a lot of pity for her. She sees mm. like the uh, kind of wounded um, wounded animal part of Brienne that's mm -hmm. just like kind of, she, she looks like she's trying to be a knight and trying to be strong and everything but Catelyn sees through that and sees that she's very vulnerable and and self-conscious too mm. if only she had some of that good mothering instincts for somebody else in her life i wonder who I who, who else could have used the treatment that the pity and the sympathy that Catelyn shows for brienne there's like is there another character that could have used that during their life that <laughs> <laughs> Catelyn did nothing wrong except that one time except for that one time <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah it's interesting to see that it, it really well I don't think a lot of people made this connection but she does have that side to her for people who aren't her children it's her reaction to John is really just um, her knowledge of history and fear of bastards and the idea that John mm -hmm. may be a threat to them because of the way primogeniture works it's she does have this side in her this is a club in her back basically well i mean i also think i i i don't know i don't want to dismiss the idea that catalan was a little bit jealous um, too yeah you know upset that mm -hmm. she had just birthed ned stark's first child mm -hmm. and she got home and there already was john with with his um you know what do they call it the the nursemaid the uh the milk, milk um well, what's her name or whatever yeah um <laughs> it shows up it? with Lila. It, right and i i mean i think i would be a little bit miffed about that i'd be like god damn it <laughs> i mean and i think like this whole in I'm, this is now a stream about Catelyn. This is now, yeah, no, and, Catelyn. <laughs> and how she did nothing wrong but um you know i sometimes think that the whole uh, narrative that she has in her head like where she's saying that she's suspicious of john and how he's he, he might succeed rob or something like that it's kind of a cover-up it's kind of true but it's also kind of covering mm. up those those feelings that she has towards ned 
that she she's kind of bitter about the whole thing. Yeah, there's about a lot of projection there. <laughs> being raised at Winterfell. <laughs> yeah. So moving on past the the surprise Catelyn stream, um, this is an important this part. Had talked about Catelyn Stark. Yeah, the Thanks. Catelyn Stark. Um, <laughs> she enters her service, and the the more important part of this relationship, although it does come back up with a feast for crows with Lady Stoneheart, is how this causes Bran to interact with Jaime Lannister. Um, while Jaime's a prisoner at River Run, um, Catelyn makes a deal with Tyrion to return Jaime in exchange for Sansa and Arya. I forget which, definitely Sansa. I don't remember if he claimed to have Arya or not. Um, and Catelyn made this deal with nobody else's input, just sort of did it on her own. Um, and it's she puts it to Brienne, has her swear an oath that she will deliver Jaime unharmed back to King's Landing. And this oath and her relationship with Jamie is very, very central to her arc. Oh, totally. And like, because we were talking about, she has these ideas of Galadon of Morn in her head, and then she meets Jamie of La Jamie Lannister. And not the perfect. Night. Not the perfect <laughs> night, but in a lot of people's minds, the the true a true mm -hmm. like one well, may not true, but a um a realistic version of a night where yeah and when she hears of what he did for king's landing like that's and you know it's not many like nobody knows that story no. uh, nobody knows jamie's side i mean i think she does see him quite differently after that and it really challenges mm -hmm. her perception of what true knighthood is and perfect knighthood mm -hmm. too during so. their during their journey, it's um very much in a way. Jamie and Brienne are sort of on the same path. Where um, Jamie was once very much like her. She had, instead of Galadon of Morn in Jamie's head, there was Arthur Dane. And mm -hmm. over time, being a knight, being a Kingsguard knight, has really eroded his idea of are these virtues worth having? Are these is this life something that? Is it real or is it just something that people make up while dudes with swords actually just run around killing people willy-nilly? And they both have these Arthurian legend perceptions mm -hmm. of knighthood. Like, um, I mean, Arthur Dane, whose name is almost undoubtedly influenced mm -hmm. by King Arthur, and Galadin of Morn, which sounds mm -hmm. like it could be directly out of... Um, Arthurian legends mm -hmm. so and, and that's kind of what we think of as just um that, that that's like the, the the hallmark stories of perfect knighthood and uh chivalry and all of that and then yeah you're right they get to try it out themselves <laughs> and realize that knights are humans with all the good and the awful sometimes more awful than good and they have to be forced to make really difficult decisions too themselves there's a lot um, more uh, gregor Clegane's out there than they want to admit right they, he seems to be more typical than brand's idea of knights are and that's that's one of the ways that her and sansa are really similar is that these are characters who are comparing the stories the ideals towards reality and finding the stories are really coming up short and trying to act like them is uh getting themselves deeper and deeper into problems mm -hmm. like at some point like brand maybe should have just like tossed jamie in a river and just gotten out of there or <laughs> something i mean you kind, of, kind of straddled him in a river oh boy well that's another part of that <laughs> <laughs> just straddle him um but you know a lot of people would not have taken that oath as seriously a lot of people would not still be thinking about it after um catelyn is gone and that she's returned jamie and brand's still going with it and that sort of inspires jamie's i wouldn't call it a reformation but sort of he's opening his eyes back again where he had like turned off a part of his personality after the killing of Ares and the seeing of Robert's rebellion. And he had to sort of become extremely cynical and didn't believe in the same things anymore. But it's after meeting Brienne, it's after this crazy journey through, 
through the Riverlands with Vargo, Hote, and the Brave Companions jumping into a bear pit um, to save Brienne, something nobody thought Jamie Lannister in a million years would ever do. And it, you can really see Brienne's influence on what, as a person. Where mm-hmm. she, this is sort of a running theme with Brienne, where a lot of people reject her because she is outside the norm. She's an outsider. She's a woman's in a man's job. She's really, well, she's really ugly, and all these other reasons to not want to associate with her in this culture. But the people that do are seemingly rewarded by it. They're improved by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and. Um... I mean, like you said, meeting Bran is so pivotal for Jamie in that I think that he really forgot what it was to kind of want to be a good person yeah. and a good knight. Like Bran has this uh, quote in Feast for Crows when she meets Sir Creighton and Sir Illifer where she says, it cheered her to know that there were still decent men in the world. And I think that that's where Jamie is at when he meets Brienne. He's at this point where he's like been so jaded and cynical for so long that he forgot what it was like to meet somebody who was decent. He's been yeah. living in King's Landing for how many years and, and dealt with his reputation, um, which is not great. <laughs> um, and just meeting Brienne, who's a decent person, makes him want to be a decent person again. And then it, it's funny because... I don't know, even though her interactions with Jamie mature her and get her to realize the challenges of knighthood and uh, the hypocrisies in society as she's trying to be a good knight, um, she becomes a little bit more jaded. And I think that in her feast chapters, she's on the verge of not being able to trust anymore. And she's just really grasping for those instances when she does meet somebody who's decent, even if it's just two hedge knights grilling or uh, cooking a trout by a stream, you know? Mm -hmm. It's also interesting that a lot of people, Jamie and Brienne is one of the more popular ships in the fandom. Um, If you don't know what a ship is, it's basically... um, (laughs) You don't know what a ship is. You don't know what a ship is. Let's let's briefly go over what a ship is. Um, It's basically fandom one hundred and one. Yeah, (laughs) it's basically uh, people that want to see two characters who are not together romantically actually end up that way. And uh, Jamie and Brienne are one of the more popular ones. And it's it's really interesting the way that develops and there is a lot of especially well a lot of people point to the heron hall baths scene for that where there's a lot of intimacy between the characters that jamie never really shows to anybody else i don't i'm not even sure he's told cersei about the truth of um what he did in, in uh with Ares and why he did it mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and there's a lot of trust there and it's it's really funny because a lot of Cersei's character is basically the flipped version of Brienne. The outside of her is otherworldly good looks. She is everybody wants Cersei, everyone, and uh, not just like um, attraction wise, but for what, what the perfect role she fits in the society. But on the inside, she is awful. <laughs> she is like the worst of persons, the no heart anymore, just terrible terrible mm-hmm. terrible and it's interesting that that the it's the inverse of cersei that seems to it be was, attracting it's jeremy so funny because cersei and brienne do have some like uh like they had some epiphanies growing up that they both encountered about you know the realities of being a woman like cersei was jealous of jamie for getting to go riding horses yeah. <laughs> and training to be a knight and she couldn't once she started growing boobs and looking <laughs> like a woman and the thing is is that brienne never started looking like a proper lady so she didn't have like all the um entitlements that cersei did or not entitlements but she she couldn't fit that mold like cersei could mm-hmm. and it's still hard for brienne looking how she is and with her talents to be in that um, night role because she is still a woman, like it or not. And people don't want to allow her into that role. They still, I don't know, like she meets um, some knights in her feast chapters that are still like pretending to protect her as <laughs> if she's a 
actually they're more in need of her protection. But it's it's just funny because Brienne and Cersei have had like similar um, conflicts growing up and realizations of what it's like to be a woman in this world. And Cersei, probably because she's just, I, I mean, I think that Brienne had it tough growing up, but I don't know. It's a whole nature versus nurture thing. And I think that nature definitely plays a part of it. Maybe <laughs> Cersei was just going to be rotten always, but growing up with a dad like Tywin and, and a family that only kind of wanted her to be a brood mare, as she puts it, it's, yeah. it can't have been, it can't have been very nice and helpful. <laughs> no, towards probably her not. It's also interesting that Brienne kind of has the situation <laughs> that Cersei wants where there's nobody in front of her. Like when Selwyn dies, Lady Briarth will be the Lady of Tarth, which mm. is something that Cersei often complains about that no matter what, she will never be allowed to inherit Casterly Rock. She has the, um, the ability to go out into the world and make her own mark, whereas Cersei has been slotted into, like you said, the broodmare role where she was married off to Robert Baratheon essentially just to create kids for Tywin's dynasty. Mm -hmm. That's that's what her life has become. But I think if you asked both of them, the other one would probably find things to be jealous of. Oh yeah, definitely. For and sure, that, yeah, it's an interesting parallel character pa parallel to explore. What I love about A Song of Ice and Fire is that you can take virtually any two characters. Um you know, like major characters and you can put them side by side and find so many similarities and differences, you know, just dualities and dichotomies mm -hmm. to explore. It's, it's just so rich. Any two characters you put next to each other, but um, yeah, Cersei and Brienne, it, it, it's one of those, but in, in their connection to Jamie, yes, their relationship with Jamie is interesting to explore from that point of view as well both pulling on different parts of his personality. Like he obviously has a lot more in common with Brienne in terms of daily lifestyle. Um, you know, they're both warriors. They're both, well, Jamie's a knight. Brienne is functionally a knight. Um, the idea of using their swords to protect people, that is not something he has in common with Cersei. Um, she mm -hmm. is very much the, um, an opposite to him. Uh, a traditional, um, well, at least in Westeros, the traditional masculine and feminine roles, whereas Jamie and Brienne are just two masculine sort of characters. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a fun discussion going on in the chat of people are talking know, about right? how sword fighting is sex and how they're... I mean, honestly, Brienne's, uh, Brienne and Jamie's sword fight scene in, um, in uh, uh, Storm of Swords is probably the hottest sex scene <laughs> in the whole world. Yeah, the they have a lot of sex without actually doing it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's true. Most of the sex scenes in in um, A Song of Ice and Fire are not that sexy. <laughs> no. But no. the sword fight that Jamie and Brienne have is. <laughs> that is erotic. And then the straddling. Oh, my God. Come on, guys. <laughs> we all know what that is. Oh, yeah. Um, and then I, I would say one of the biggest moments of growth by the end of Jamie's arc is after Brienne delivers him back, she now has to deal with Loras Tyrell, who has been named to the King's Guard and definitely wants Brienne mm. dead. Oh yes. And it comes down to Jamie fucking Lannister, the guy who is basically mostly just out for himself, who has a does not see other people as people, the most jaded of characters. He sticks up for Brienne of Tarth and talks Loras out of murdering her and actually brings up like really solid logical points about what happened and like who Brienne is a character and her relationship to Runley and how this never would have happened. Mm -hmm. a, a Game of Thrones, Jamie Lannister would have watched them fight and enjoyed it. <laughs> no. And then he has a dress made for her and has it like padded out so that it's like complimenting her figure it's it's crazy like all the, this change that it like he's trying to make her look better to kind of match how he sees her it's oh, not like that's, yeah. that's, how I, that's why i bring up the dress thing because he i i think it's him like wanting her to wanting the rest of the world to see her as he sees her that's commentary on that but, but. then like selwyn he also gives her a sword 
gives her the dress and the sword at the same time. Yeah. The confusion continues for Brienne of Tarth. <laughs> well, but she loves it. It's, I mean, we know what that sword is. He's oh. kidding. We really know what that means. Hey, oh. <laughs> yep. Well, it's, and, and, and he's, he's acting as the maiden too and giving yes. just made. Yeah, gives her the magic sword. And now the perfect knight, Brienne of Tarth. Although it's interesting, a lot of uh, Tarth is generally associated with night and darkness. That's what a lot of the names are. But then you look at their, actually, hang on, let me show this for the stream. If you look at their sigil, which I have on my cup, it's not just the moons, they also have the suns. Oh, I want one of those cups. <laughs> it's so cool. And what do you have on the bottom? Oh, uh, it, it'll just spill my water everywhere, Lauren. What are you trying to do to me? <laughs> Spill it, spill it. <laughs> it says the seat is strong on the bottom with dunk on the other side, which um, nice. we didn't really talk about. Maybe we'll get to a DM, maybe in some questions or something like that. But her connections to Duncan the Tall and my theorized connections to how strong. But uh, we'll get to the theories. We'll get to the theories <laughs> later. Um, we're not even like through Storm of Swords yet. <laughs> no, I, I, we're good with Storm of Swords. We're moving on to to maybe the part of Brienne's story that people love the most. I love it the most. Well, at least Lauren does. It's Lauren all loves Brienne the most. All, the time. <laughs> all Brienne all the time. So um, she leaves King's Landing. She has a letter from King Tommen. She has Oathkeeper, half of Ned Stark's uh, Valyrian Steel Sword Ice. And she has a new quest. Jamie mm. Lannister has charged her to find the Stark daughters and return them to Lady Catelyn. She also has, has like a few bags of. Uh... Um, copper stars and 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 silvers and and gold dragons, and I'm always like kind of when I was rereading these chapters, I'm always like, Brienne, aren't you spending too much money? Like she, she <laughs> says that she has water, but it seems like she like kind of she literally throws some of the gold into a grave <laughs> for Nimble Dick. Yeah. Um, but. I don't know. I, I found myself being anxious about that, but then I realized, well, she eventually gets captured by um, the Brotherhood Without Banners, and then they probably take her money. Like they do to everybody. Her. She gets to spend it. She wants to. <laughs> well, I, was I mean, bit... not sure I go on that tangent, but I'm just like very protective of Brienne and her resources. I'm like, you might need that. <laughs> I am unworried about it because she's so much like Dunk, and whenever Dunk needs money, George makes it magically happen. So she'll be fine. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> She'll be fine. Uh, so her Feast for Crows arc is, I would say, that one of the highlights of the book, maybe the highlight for me. Um, in this, we get a, a very, very, very different look at Westeros. Before, um, Brienne had been sort of going between royal court to royal court to royal court with parts of it at the end with Jamie and but sort of a travel log thing, but... With the Feast for Crows, we really get into more the Hedge Knight style, where this is Brienne on her quest, trying to find Sansa, failing miserably. And actually, that's one of those things I always find interesting about Brienne's um, story in a, in a Feast for Crows, is there's actually a popular Reddit post from a, a few, like a month or so ago, where people were talking about, well, it's pointless, isn't it? She doesn't find Sansa. So... Mm. So why does this arc matter? So Lauren, why does why does it matter if she doesn't find Sansa? Have you ever heard about it's the journey not contested? <laughs> it not matter. Um, like I was saying earlier, I mean, I meant to save it for for like right now since we're at feast, mm -hmm. but I was so excited about it. I, I really think that um, Brienne's quest for Sansa is in a big part a quest for herself, and um, just that trusting innocent nature that she's lost along the way um and rightfully so because she's had so many bad experiences mm. with people it's amazing that she's still as as good natured and, and kind as she is but that's just who brienne is um and it's it's about brienne keeping her oath too i mean this is her pursuit of perfect knighthood um it is it does feel like finding a needle in a haystack there's one point where she's at um what the sinking goose i think mm -hmm. and she gets a glass of wine or a cup of wine and there's like a hair in the wine <laughs> and she pulls it out she's like this is this is my chance <laughs> finding Sansa in the wilderness but i think like she i mean obviously she had a better chance of finding a hair in her wine than she does of finding 
Sansa in Westeros. It's just, but she has to try. Like she told um, the the elder on Quiet Isle, you know, all this has happened to me, but this is the one thing that I'm trying to do to prove to myself that it hasn't all been in vain. And if I die trying, so be it. Mm. Um, I mean, it's really the the pursuit rather than the attainment of the goal that matters more to knighthood. I mean, we think of knighthood and, and all these things that they achieve, um, I don't know, getting to the Holy Grail or whatever, mm-hmm. but it, it's really not about that. It's never been about that. It's It's been about the quest and the finding of oneself and the friends we meet along the way. <laughs> the, the real <laughs> Song of Ice and Fire it. is the friends we meet along the way. Oh my God. Oh, and she does just fell over in my background here. Oh boy. When I said that. Oh, oh your little girl okay. <laughs> and uh brienne the oh yeah. the illustrated version of game of thrones let me see if i can um, plus your line plus your breakfast yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so where were we uh we're talking about brienne's oath and why she's doing this and i think we were talking <clears throat> about early on how it matters in a way that Brynn is framed in this sort of mythical, magical way. She's following uh, a legendary figure. She has references to these other fantasy stories. But then trying to find Sansa and Arya, but mostly Sansa. I think the Arya thing's kind of a show invention. Um, mm-hmm. I don't quite remember. Don't quote me on that. This is, this is really a personal one. This is just about... Um, she's not doing this to find Lightbringer. She's not doing this to hatch dragons or to identify the hero of destiny that will save them from the others. This story is about her and her interactions with Jamie and Catelyn and what it means to keep your word and what it, and how all these larger quests that are going on around her are destroying the world they're trying to save. And that, that's one of the things for Feast for Crows. The name says what it is. The Feast for Crows is the uh, common people of Westeros. And that's sort of what Brienne has to deal with. Like, she is trying to help Catelyn. She's trying to help the Starks. But it's also the Starks and their men that are just causing this destruction. She's trying yeah. to help the High Lords. And it's the wolves in the Riverlands, along with the lions, that are just... Just Mm -hmm. destroying and killing and enabling the people that end up eventually uh, that have hurt her in the past and in the future. Yeah, it's it's so devastating. Um, I mean, it's it's fun reading her chapters because I feel like I'm on this quest with her, but it's so dark. There's just. Yeah, it it just is this perilous journey through her Mm -hmm. chapters and every once in a while you meet somebody and you're like, Ooh, can I trust this person along with Brienne? Um, Like as a reader, you're not sure who you can trust. (laughs) And it's not like I'm egging Brienne on to trust nimble Dick because I don't know (laughs) until they actually get character. Yeah. Yeah. Until the very end. I mean, you realize, Oh, he was trying to show her to, um, the, the fool that he fooled, which is um, Shagwell. Mm-hmm. And it, even though it ended up not being a good end for either of them, um, I mean, it wasn't who she was seeking. It, it was who he knew he was just trying to do his best. Mm-hmm. And Brienne feels so bad for not trusting him, but it's, it's so hard um, to trust when there's all this death and destruction and, and the fallout of the red wedding and um well tywin's death has had an impact on the small folk Mm -hmm. too i mean everything's just kind of chaos in um the areas surrounding king's landing and people are trying to figure out like who's in charge and how to (laughs) organize themselves and how to protect themselves and brienne is on this crazy quest to fulfill an oath and it's it's like the one thing that she knows that she has to do, but it's it's just impossible with what's going on in the rest of the story. And it's the whole no chance, no choice thing. Mm-hmm. Um, she says that just once, but it feels like that's her whole arc. No chance, no, no choice. choice yeah. 
And she even ends up, uh, she has kind of a motley crew uh, following her around. Uh, first, it's just her. Uh, she picks up Podrick, who has been, um, he is not gifted to her like she is, like he is in the show. Uh, he discovers her, him trying to essentially follow her because much like Brienne, Podrick has lost, um, lost his place in the world. T yeah. Tyrion is gone. Um, nobody wants him anymore. Um, what's he going to do with his life? He's like, fuck, I guess I follow around Bri Brienne. She recognizes it and ends up taking mm -hmm. him under her wing. Much, uh, uh, not much, but more kind than she is in the show to Podrick. There's much more tough love element of um, mm -hmm. Gwen's Brienne towards Podrick. Oh, She's uh, a lot harsher in the show. <laughs> and then one of the more interesting members of her little crew is Sir Heil Hunt. And it's, if you ask Brienne of Tarth, who would she want to be journeying around Westeros with? Kyle Hunt might be near the bottom, and that's specifically because of his role in a bet. Yes. The unfortunate yes. bet. Uh, yeah, he's so smarmy. It's yeah. So um, when she was at Highgarden in in Renly's camp, there were um, all these other knights who were courting her. Uh, including Heil Hunt. And she was kind of not trusting of it, but on the other hand, she kind of liked it. Like they would bring her flowers and sing her songs. And then finally, Randall Tarly um, said that, that there has to be a stop to this. And I forgot who it was that told Brienne about it. Um, but like, this was all a bet to see who could bet her first. Mm -hmm. They all put in some gold, um, you know, they put money into a hat and they're like, whoever takes her maiden head gets all this money. Yep. And uh, it's just the worst. But then she gets revenge at the <laughs> melee at Bitter Bridge yep. and cuts them all down one by one and um, gets run it as well. Gets so, run it, yep. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that Heil Hunt shows up in Feast and he's actually trying to be kind of decent, but he's still kind of a dick and you I don't trust like him. it. He was part no. of that. <laughs> no, and and I you you kind of feel Brienne thinking, well, should I trust him again? No, I'm not going to. He's he's terrible and made me feel terrible. And even if he's trying to be nice to me now, I I don't know what it's for, but I don't trust him. I mean, the obvious answer is um, trying to marry her for Tarth. Because as yeah. everyone knows, she still she has a lordship attached to her name. Whoever marries her will become. Um, in maybe not in the official title, but in a practical sense, they will become the lord of quite a lot of land and their children. It's kind of the same thing, just on a larger scale as putting money into a hat to um, try and take a girl's maiden head. I mean, yeah. isn't that kind of what it is? It's. I, I wonder if like that whole bet is actually just commentary, like <laughs> meta on, on what this patriarchal society is like as far as marrying women off and positioning them as brood mares. Yeah. And, and that's all that they're good for. And placeholders for a lord's title if he doesn't have any sons. It's hard to, it's hard to separate that from what Heil is spending all this time with Brienne for, and she never really forgets that never really gets over that um like we talk about with uh nimble dick like a lot of her distrust of nimble dick is from people especially like literally Hyle. Hyle is the one that has really broken her trust in people um and it kind of also served to break her trust in renly because um this happened in his camp didn't it his high garden mm -hmm. camp and yeah her protector the guy who had danced with her um his men were doing the worst version of everything she feared. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that was almost kind of like, I, I sometimes I get show and book confused and I have to sit with my thoughts for a minute and be like, wait a minute, was this in the show or in the books? But in the <laughs> show, I just watched this episode like last night, I think, mm -hmm. coincidentally, but she's telling her version of, um, she's telling the story of her father's ball and it sounds a bit like in the show, even though they left out the Heil Hunt and camp followers or um, knights and followers courting her at Renly's camp, 
even though they left that bit out in the show, that she she kind of told it as it happened at the ball. Mm-hmm. And um, she talked about how there were all these lords who were asking her to dance and courting her and telling her how pretty she was. And then it ended up that they were just poking fun at her and yeah. trying to get her to laugh. And I don't think that's how how she told it in the books, but it seems like in the show, it's more of a merged version of um, the knights at High Garden and the ball. Mm-hmm. It's not great, wh- whichever way we're talking about. And Hyle spends most of a feast for crows. Uh, once he finds, once he comes across, um, Brienne kind of latches on to her. At least he's not lying this time. I, I think that's like the one thing you can say about Hyle. He is not pretending to like her. He is saying outright throughout most of it. He even proposes marriage at some point that like, listen, nobody else is going to marry you. I was a shithead to you six months ago. I haven't changed. But. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he is being honest and maybe honest this is, is like yeah. the the realistic version of events for um how things would go down if Brienne just decided to give up her quest and go home. And, you know, maybe there's an AU where Brienne does decide to do that. And she's like, Hey, you know what? You're right. You know, this is bullshit. I'm not going to find <laughs> stuff. This is crazy. Let's just go with how things work here in this society and I'll marry you. We'll go back to Tarth. Ever will forget this whole thing ever happened. <laughs> we won't like okay. each other. It'll, it'll just be a political marriage. Fine. <laughs> but well, but that's how it works. And we have like a script for that. And right now everything is just completely off the rails. Like everything is just going down the tube in this society. Like that, that would, he's almost like sort of proposing Let's get back on track. Let, let's try to return to some kind of normalcy because shit is fucked right now. <laughs> yeah. And much, a lot of the same way that everything Brienne wants eventually turns bad. Well, she wanted Renly first, then she wanted Jamie, and now she's being presented with Heil fucking Hunt. <laughs> and there, there, there is like no AU that exists anywhere where Brienne decides to take him up on his offer. Like, I'm, I'm no. just putting that out there. I, I imagined it, but I don't think that there is any parallel universe where that happens, <laughs> like, actually. Well, you you heard that stream. Everybody get on that. Start writing the <laughs> Heil Hunt Brienne of Tarth no. AU. Send it to Shakespeare no. of Thrones. She wants God, to no. read it. All um, Actually, I haven't looked at the viewer numbers. Looks like we're at 120 people. Thanks, everybody, for coming out and hanging out. Um, hit that like button, share, social media, all the things. Um also, write your fanfics about Pyle Hunt and uh, Brienne. And I, I would another major person that interacts with Brienne during this time is another Davos's fingers, a Song of Madness favorite, and that is Nimble Dick Crab. Mm. That is a relationship that is wild. <laughs> it's unbelievable that Brienne thinks this guy is trustworthy. That. Well, not to, that he has what she wants. Like, of all the places you could go, you're on Crackclaw Point, you're in the stinking goose, you see a nimble dick, and you're like, you know what? I think this guy has the key to finding Sansa Stark. Well, it didn't necessarily happen like that. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, she was told who nimble dick was when he yeah, came yeah. in. <laughs> so when she saw him, she's. I think she was like, huh. Well, he's pretty skinny, but I can't <laughs> follow him if he has some clues. Mm-hmm. And in, um, it, but it, yeah, but, uh, he he is an icon, truly. Nimble Dick. The Nimble Dick yeah, of legend. Was it last year that people yeah. were, were wrapped about Nimble Dick? Yes, they did. They were trying great. to push him to the finals. Didn't end up working. Uh, oh. Nimble Dick got knocked out rather earlier this year. But it's also interesting that... Um, if you think about what Nimble Dick is doing in Brienne's story, I mean, he is kind of ridiculous, and his story is about squishers and messing with Podrick. It's it's a, it's low stakes. It's it's he's kind of a foolish character, and Brienne's on a foolish quest, like um, sort it's of. Oh, she's like, I'll yeah. follow this. Maybe it sounds interesting. It sounds like it could lead to something else. Who knows? Doesn't doesn't lead anywhere. No, it just leads doesn't. to pain and sorrow. Um, 
Yeah. And it, it, through Nimble Dick, we get delivered one of the, I think, the saddest lines of A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to read this one? You want me to. I'm sorry that I never trusted you. I don't know how to do that anymore. Oh. 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 Poor, poor Brienne. Nimble Dick was not actually a Heil Hunt level dick. He was really just trying to help her. He was doing his best in a world that was falling apart around them. Um, mm-hmm. And his death is was an avoidable one. And I think that's one of the things that Brienne really, um, really internalizes about his death. It's th- his death was a failing on her part. Yeah, I think she feels bad about it, too. Like, if it hadn't been for her, this probably wouldn't have happened to him. Probably still be alive. Yeah, and it's so... I find it interesting how he gets his face smashed in. And then a few chapters later in Brienne's POV, she gets half her face bitten off. Yeah. I, I almost kind of wonder if it's a weird... I mean, I don't even want to say that it's... it's um karma because i don't think brianne did anything wrong brianne does nothing wrong but i i don't know if anybody has any ideas about that it could also just be like sort of symbolic like i don't know maybe losing face Hmm. is is um something that we're supposed to consider as part of uh, this this questing journey and having to deal with that but brianne has had to deal with i mean brianne is already unattractive enough like she doesn't yeah. need that it's it's so, so. cruel <laughs> <sighs> so bad poor poor nimble dick um and that's and then there's one major other spot well there's two others uh the first one is uh her journey to the quiet isle because for some reason she's looking for the hound because he heard that she was with aria and ends up mm-hmm. on the quiet isle meeting the um the elder brother obviously she does find sandor clegane the one person she's looking for she finds misses it completely it's kind of um yeah. kind it's of not oh, really safe okay. it's like a don quixote kind of like a knight and motley sort of thing also very a dunkish thing where the thing she's questing for you did find it Brian. you finally got mm-hmm. one but it's just kind of missed it just sort of went right past her Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Quiet Isle is my favorite chapter because it just feels like this release of emotions when she's talking to the elder brother. And it comes on the heels of that chapter where Septon Maribald gives um, mm-hmm. Broken Man speech. The Broken speech. Man speech? Did somebody say the Broken Man speech? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere Bookshelf Stud is saying it all out right now. <laughs> somewhere he he knows that i just said it um but yeah i mean that's one of the most iconic speeches in all of a song of ice and fire and i think that that's really pivotal and in brienne considering how she might end up a broken man broken woman herself and she's just got the weight of this quest and in the weight of her past and she has these flashbacks all the time she's like continuously living in these um memories of her childhood and upbringing and um shitty mentors she's had (laughs) and shitty things that people have done to her and yet she's still like keeping her head high and it's like this therapy session she has with the elder brother where she just kind of lets it all come pouring out and it's very cathartic for her and that's that quote that i read at the beginning of the stream that just sums up everything that she's been through and yet how determined she is to keep on going that is one of the stronger parts of uh brienne's arc is many people would have given up long 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 ago on everything she's doing um Mm -hmm. they would have given up on their oaths they would have given up on their quest they would have given up on this lifestyle like the that i think that's kind of the point of heil hunt as we're reading her feast for crows thing is this entire time there is the aspect of normalcy following her around trying to tempt her in a way mm-hmm. just being like you know we, we can just go back we can go to tarth we'll have children it'll be you don't have to do this to yourself it's too hard knighthood's bullshit all that kind of stuff <laughs> and brienne is continually saying no this is worth it 
it the mm -hmm. these my word and my oaths and living up to the ideals and trying to be gallowed on is a worthy idea a worthy way to spend my life and she constantly has those opportunities to turn back and to go back to tarth like i mean when renly died she could have gone back to tarth instead she decided to serve catalan and when she fulfilled her um, mission to bring Jamie back to King's Landing. She could have <laughs> come back to Tarth instead. She just, she took up Jamie's. Um, she she decided with Jamie to go find Sansa, um, and she could have taken Randall Tarley's um, command offer. Yeah. And I was saying offer, <laughs> but you're right. Man, I'm going to put you on a ship tomorrow that's bound for Tarth. Mm -hmm. And she's like. With all due respect, sir, no. <laughs> no thanks. And she keeps on going. And then there's Heil Hunt. And yeah, she's constantly being offered an alternative, but she constantly turns it down in favor of the harder thing, which is continuing her quest. The harder noble thing. Mm -hmm. Nobility means quite a lot to her. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that is really endearing about her as a character and why her arc matters so many to so many people, why they why she got so many votes, why she kept beating people in that um in the Davos' Fingers tournament, is that she does keep trying no matter what. Like George is literally destroying everything good in her life in her life one page at a time. And this character just does not give up. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's it's amazing how good she is, but how real she is. I think that almost every other character in A Song of Ice and Fire, well, most other characters, they have this dark side to them, but Brienne does not. I feel like her dark side is her self-doubt and hmm. her um, struggle with trusting and losing her innocence and belief in, you know, knighthood and the legends and all of that kind of like with Sansa mm -hmm. uh, and how Sansa wants to believe in the fairy tales and the myths and, um, and all of that. But that's, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that we, we had a question. I'm not sure if we're on to questions yet, but I feel like we're getting there. No, <laughs> anyway. we're getting there. Had, yeah. Uh, th there are some questions about like, what has Brienne done bad in her life? And it's interesting to ponder because it's hard to come up with something, but it doesn't necessarily mean she's a goody two shoes and that she does, that she's completely a hundred percent. I don't know. I mean, she is a hundred percent good. What she's a hundred percent good. Come on, Lauren. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> but, but I mean, she's not without her demons and that's no. what makes her, it, I would say Brienne does nothing wrong ever, <laughs> and ever. Uh, her real problem is that she's written into a story written by George R. R. Martin. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no. if, that's like uh, we have so much fanfic with Bri Brienne and Jamie just ending up happily ever after because a, we all kind of want that to some degree, <laughs> but I don't know. Also, I I, I kind of like struggle with the I, I've been like a Brienne Jamie shipper. Like at times, and then other times, I'm like, God, I wish that Brienne could just have her own fucking story. <laughs> involved Jamie so much, at least in, from the fandom's perspective, because I appreciate her so much as she is. That's um, true. But there is a part of me that, yeah, thinks it would be nice if she and Jamie could just go back to Tarth and get married and live quietly for the for the rest of their days. <laughs> that would be sweet. Uh, Guilty Undertaker in the chat had a, a good comment. He says, "Brienne is the one." woman in 10,000 as Eamon would say she is oh she is she is when it comes down to doing what's right and what's smart Brienne always chooses what's right much sometimes to her detriment although pretty much always to her detriment <laughs> much in the same way that Ned just and his children after him trying to live up to that ideal of the noble person sticking to their guns and yeah, paying but she's for not, it. She's not like the, um, the, there's no scarier thing than a truly just man. Mm -hmm. She's not a Stannis. It's no. like, like because <laughs> 10, men kind of applies to Stannis as well as it applies to Brienne. Mm -hmm. So it's weird to think of that. Like, um, 
how, how different they are because Brienne shows so much mercy and, and empathy and Stannis does not <laughs> most of the time. Nope, Stannis <laughs> continues to be the worst, the rotten onion. Mm. I say this to Lauren, who's about to kill me for insulting her beloved Stannis. You know, I mean, it, it's not like my beloved Stannis. Beloved I, I Stannis, do... I said it. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, I do like Stannis a lot and find him very interesting. Um, he's, he's not my son. Like, Brienne is my daughter. It's just mm -hmm. never been a thing. <laughs> Stannis is the problematic fave. He's, he's nobody's son is the problem, and that's <gasps> why he's always the way he is. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Um, so to finish up where they end it, where Brienne ends up in the books, um, she kind of gets left in a bit of a lurch by George. Uh, obviously, it wins a winner, and the succeeding books have not come out. Um, what ends up happening is that Brienne uh, ends up at the in at the crossroads, which turns out Gendry um, Waters is there for some reason with a whole bunch of orphans, and they are attacked. By, I believe it's the Brave Companions, and uh, mm -hmm. led by um, mm -hmm. uh, Rorge and Biter. They thought yeah. they were. It's it's awful, but we get the iconic quote, the yes. iconic quote: "The door to the inn banged open. Willow stepped out into a rain, a crossbow in her hands. The girl was shouting at the riders, but a clap of thunder rolled across the yard, drowning out her words." As it faded, Brienne heard the man in the hound's helm say, Loose a quarrel at me and I'll shove that crossbow up your cunt and fuck you with it. God damn it, George. <laughs> then I'll pop your fucking eyes out and make you eat them. The fury in the man's voice drove Willem back a step, trembling. Seven, Brienne thought again, despairing. She had no chance against the seven, she knew. No chance, no choice. She stepped out into the rain, oath keeper in her hand. Leave her be. If you want to rape somebody, try me. Wow. Oh. Wow. No chance and no choice. She has to and, do the right thing. And she knows that something awful is going to happen to her. Like, there's just this sense of impending doom. But she still, it's, it's kind of like, it reminds me of how Sir Goodwin in her memory told her, um, if you flinch, you're dead. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't flinch before you kill. And to me, like, she's going in for the kill at this moment and like she doesn't have a moment to think about whether she's going to do it or not it's just like no chance no choice is is her mantra for not just killing somebody but making a choice like that because mm -hmm. uh, she does have a choice yeah <laughs> she's always she's been presented with choices uh, constantly throughout. <laughs> yeah and i mean but for her there is no choice she's already made up her mind and that's what sets her apart from other knights, her sticking to her values and deciding that she's in this for real, for keeps. And it's worth dying for. That's the, the, the no choice. She has to step forward and protect these people. But she also knows that she's, this is likely going to kill her. That even with her magic sword, she is not Galadon of Morn. Those seven people are probably going to kill her. And it actually comes very, very close. Um, oh, hey, uh, Chloe of uh, Girls Gone Cannon showed up. Hey, Chloe. Um, good timing. Uh, she's also a hardcore Brienne stan. Yay. I don't know if uh, she has her own fan fiction out there, probably for Brienne. It seems oh, come on. Chloe definitely written fanfic. I. Chloe, have you written fanfic? Come on. Chloe, please answer. If you have, please link it. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's it's that she has decided at this moment that after all she's been through, after Renly and Jamie and Nimble Dick, that these kids in these in in this inn are worth dying for. That it's not just it, it's it's the expression of what she went through the lesson she internalized from Renly that she has the opportunity to be the shield for these people that the that they need help and she can give it and maybe mm -hmm. that's the meaning in her life at this point yeah she just wants to protect the weak and the innocent even though she's really struggling herself with um believing in the things that she once believed when 
she felt innocent mm -hmm. and she's struggling to regain that trust in other people, which I feel like if she loses all trust, then she won't be the kind of knight that she is right now, wanting to uphold those values and protect the weak and innocent. So it's just this constant struggle for her. It's like she's walking a tightrope throughout this entire arc and barely staying on it. But <laughs> um, we'll see what happens, I guess, when she has POVs or not in The Winds of Winter or not. <laughs> published I, I mean i i hope so it's um oh, oh super chat here from uh ross tremblay thank you very much for the two dollars um oh. chloe apparently has never written uh fan fiction she writes scientific analysis on the thrones <laughs> i mean fair enough I, do. Me I also i also think it's important in this uh in the moment at this fight which um we'll talk about what happens at the end of it and that that's awful but it's she's also in that moment giving up on Sansa she's giving up on Arya where she has said there are children she has to go protect she has to fulfill her oaths but is that oath more important than would she let these kids die for those oaths because she could she could run away and the orphans would be at the mercy of Biter but then it's basically like letting herself die too. Yeah. If she gives up on her quest, if she gives up on her oath, she's pretty much giving up on herself. And Brienne doesn't know what that would be like. Mm. Um, she just doesn't know any alternative. And there, there is, there is no choice. I mean, there is, but there isn't. So it's, it's a really good quote to kind of pick apart like that. It's true. It's one of those chapters that is absolutely brutal to read, but it's such a perfect ending to her A Feast for Crows. Um, well, it's, well, it's not quite the ending. There's one but more. But it feels like it. It feels like it. It feels like the like, climax. Her last chapter is kind of, it almost feels like a Brienne epilogue. Kind it of. almost feels like the start of her yeah. uh, next narrative, you know, because it's just she wakes up someplace completely different. Lady Stoneheart, oh my god. <laughs> it feels more uh, like an epilogue. Well, at the end of the fight, um, Biter corners her and starts eating her face. Literally eating her face. Thanks, George. That's that's a POV I wanted to know about. I wanted to imagine what it was like to have somebody try and eat your face while you're still alive. Good yeah. god. Um, ends up being saved by uh, a spear through the back of Biter's face that she passes out from her injuries. Like you said, she wakes up with the Brotherhood Without Banners who have been taken over by her former patron, Catelyn Stark. And the reason that she's been brought before Lady Catelyn is because Oathkeeper and the letter she has from King Tommen, where Catelyn has really been on a streak of trying to punish everybody connected with the Lannisters and the Red Wedding in any way possible. Mm -hmm. And Brienne is sitting there with two. I mean, Oathkeeper is her sword, but it was meant for Jamie, so it looks like a Lannister sword. It's got the. That's kind of how it goes. And her letter from King Tom and pardoning her for whatever she does, and et cetera, et cetera. They bring her before Lady Stoneheart, and she, even though Heil Hunt tries to defend her, Heil Hunt's still with her at this point. Bless Heil Hunt. Um, bless they, Heil Hunt. Bless Heil Hunt. Podrick, Brienne, and Heil are all stringed up to be hung by lady stoneheart and the question that's put to brienne she can save them she can save all their lives if if she delivers jamie lannister to lady stoneheart for punishment mm -hmm. and it leaves off with all of them still hanging mm -hmm. what the hell george that's where you leave it <laughs> What's gonna happen? Oh my god! <laughs> She's allowed to. Yeah. She has to say a word. She has to say, "Was it um, noose or sword or something like that?" Yeah, I've... noose or sword, and she chooses sword. Sword, which Me... is not in the books, but confirmed by George that she. And she that's some Connor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find this so interesting because. I mean, Catalan is one of the few people in her life that she totally trusted. And Catalan um, uh, is now dark 
Catalan, uncatalan, mm -hmm. Lady Stoneheart. Like she's the total opposite of everything that she was when when she was alive. Even though there were hints that she could go dark and go down mm -hmm. that path, and um, instead mm -hmm. of being the nurturing maternal figure that she was, she's wants to kill everybody that ever betrayed her or, or wronged her in any way. And now Brienne, I feel like is is struggling with mm -hmm. the I don't know, Brienne could very well go down a dark path and end up more like pretty Maris yes. as alluding to earlier. Um or she could um stay true and and keep protecting the weak and the innocent and be be a true knight as she is. But Catalan as Lady Stoneheart is presenting this here's another alternative that Brienne is being <laughs> presenting. And it's like, there's no chance, no choice again. Yeah. Almost. Stoneheart is telling her, you need to bring Jamie to it, to me so I can kill him. And Jamie is another person that Brienne has trusted or thinks that she trusts. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are points where she's wondering if this whole quest was a jape by Jamie, but she wants to trust him. And, oh man, just, it's, it's such a, dense nest of emotions and dark paths and it's just like this huge tangle of of woods that we're in right now with yeah. the end and oh how's George it gonna is, turn out george is having a real good time putting brienne in the exact situations that test her morality and her conceptions of herself because of course that's what he does it makes for great reading unfortunately to put such a good person through such torture and as you were alluding to let um let's talk briefly for a little bit about um where she's going in the future i mean we have the show version where she ends up almost having all of her dreams come true the only thing that was missing was she did not actually get jamie as um as her oh, she got jamie. well she got jamie you know what i'm saying <laughs> But she did not marry him. She did. They did not end up together. But she did end up a. Uh, she was knighted by Jamie Lannister. She joined the the King's Guard as the Lord Commander for King Bran. Um, she was able to write Jamie's legacy for the rest of the world to see for all of time because the White Book will essentially tell his she made story. I'm true too. Yeah, but George gave us a hint of that he's not going to be quite as kind to Brienne. And that mm. is my uh, the video I made about Pretty Maris. Um, it's, I'll put the links in the description. If you're watching this back, it'll probably be a link up here in the corner above Lauren's head, um, where essentially I argued that he had planned a five-year gap, and which was he was going to move the narrative forward five years in order to solve some of his problems in the book. And one of the characters, what he did with the characters when he decided not to do this was he didn't just throw them away. I mean, pff, George R. R. Martin throws nothing away. He still has his notes from when he was a little kid sitting in a, a drawer somewhere. <laughs> and he sells all his action but figures. No house for Tarth. <laughs> yeah. No house words for Tarth. Somehow those were lost in the in the shuffle. But basically, um, Brienne was going to turn to this character called Pretty Maris of the Windblown, which is a she's known as a torturer she has no life left in her she is essentially just the totality of the broken man a few a dark future of brienne even down to the facial scars there's this weird mm -hmm. thing where um uh, she's threatened to have her breast cut off when she's captured i think by the brave companions that has actually happened to pretty maris it's like all the bad things in the world you could think of to do to brienne have happened to maris and part of me really worries that that is where George is going to take her. Is he can continue her down this path of deconstructing her personality and challenging her until the point that there's nothing left of the Brienne we know. Mm -hmm. I really hope that's not what he's going to do, but he's clearly written that already. I, I don't think so because we already have pretty Maris True. and it's like he's presenting that as sort of um, like, how Brienne could be, but since he's already written Pretty Maris mm -hmm. and that dark version of what Brienne could be, or you know what we at least imagine Brienne could be, mm -hmm. it's hard to read the description of Pretty Maris and not think of Brienne. It's on the nose. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Since he's already written that, I think he has something else planned for Brienne. Um, I don't know. The thing is, is that I'm a lot more fond of coming up with backstory theories and ideas than I am <laughs> coming up with mm -hmm. future stuff. I think that's why I enjoyed season eight so much, because I just didn't really do a whole lot of theorizing about it and just went with it. But um, I, I don't know. For the future, I, I see... I mean, Lady Stoneheart has to die. She has to be killed by somebody, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we all agree that's got to happen. It's going to happen. And I think that the two more pop, the two most popular choices of characters to kill her are Arya and Brienne. I think it would be really interesting if Brienne killed Lady Stoneheart because it mm. would be putting her in a position kind of like Jamie was, where he swore an oath Ooh, to protect somebody. The Mad Queen. And then had to make a really... The Mad King. <laughs> And yeah. then had to make a difficult decision to um, kill him to save the lives of many others. And wouldn't it be something if Brienne killed Lady Stoneheart, who she once swore an oath to as Catalan to protect and serve. Mm -hmm. And she has to do that. She has to kill her for the lives of many others. Kill her with that um, sword. Oh, my God. I didn't even think about that. Holy crap. <laughs> that sounds like something Ooh. George would do. <laughs> That sound like something George would do. Oh. But then I also see, I, I feel like that would fuck up Brienne. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Thing, I feel like it would just, ugh. So I almost kind of want Arya to do it, mm -hmm. as a lot of people have theorized. And then Arya's at risk for going totally dark. <laughs> and, then, and then Brienne has to bring Arya back <laughs> from, from like, oh, no. Style come this way <laughs> turn away from the dark darkness but i don't know i think that that's mm, that's like a little bit more of a complex scenario in my head because Arya still has to come back from bravos and all yeah, of that yeah it's a long way off like, for her to do I, that i understand why a lot of people want Arya to do it because of her connections her, her themes surrounding mercy and death and calling herself cat of the canals and everything. But mm -hmm. I, I think she's got a lot, like there's a lot of narrative that needs to happen. <laughs> if she's going to kill Lady Stoneheart. Um, and I think it's more likely that Brienne will do it. They have to get and out of the cave somehow. They got to get Jamie out. Will, Jamie will console Brienne. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so Brienne. Can another straddle on a river, is that what you're saying? Sorry, I mean fanfic. Another sword fight? <laughs> So, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to imagine that Brienne's eventual outcome will be much different from in the show where she ends up as Kingsguard. I, I think that that'll, I hope that, I hope slash think slash expect, I don't know, that that will end up as pretty close to how it was in the show just because George kind of said that everybody more or less has their endpoints in the book as they do in the show, even though they got yeah. there differently. I think that anyway more or less <laughs> but um even though we argue about it um i i don't know how she's going to get there yeah it's a, i just it's a good question i just know there's going to be a lot of angst but i don't think it will end up she'll end up as dark as pretty maris no that that would probably be the worst case scenario he may have just been having some fun there like a lot of the other windblows characters are so dark. awful like who's gonna hold tarth like what's what's gonna happen with that who's gonna be the even star <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Brienne got to get going on making them kids. <laughs> Something better happen in that cave. Come on, get in there. Um, <laughs> Chloe is requesting that we call her Brienne. I refuse. Oh. I will ban people that call her Brienne. You will be out of here. Um, oh, uh, Aziz from History of Westeros just showed up. Oh, we could do um, what Aziz did in his Clash in his Crusader Kings two thing, where uh, Brienne married a Targaryen and then. They had massive Targaryen, Valyrian kids. It was wonderful. Maybe that's what the world of ice and fire was alluding to when they said that Targaryen or Tarth has more recent connections to House Targaryen and their lineage. Maybe they're <laughs> writing it from like, maybe World of Ice and Fire was written from the future. <laughs> yes. And Aziz's <laughs> Crusader Kings 2 game. They're like, we're referencing this, pers this possible future. Um, yeah, it's yeah. they definitely have to get out of the cave. So somebody's dying, and the Brotherhood without banners. A lot of people suspect that um, 
this that might be the end of Stoneheart or they escape. Um, I don't I don't think that will be the end of Jamie and Brienne though. It seems like George has much more in mind with them, and I definitely agree with the show that um, I think it will be Jamie that will knight Brienne. That he has recognized in her the Galadon of Morn. <laughs> that she is the hero of legend mm. somebody that is worthy of the magic sword so at some point i think that's going to happen i mean he basically kind of knighted her by giving her oath keeper so mm -hmm. at some point i think he'll just make it official um as to whether or not they'll end up hooking up at a feast after being the white walkers who knows um there's definitely sexual tension between them um but it is different it's very different in the in the books not to harp on this again but it Brienne is very, very, very unattractive, and it makes a lot more sense that somebody like, at least visually when you're looking at the show, that Jamie and Gwendolyn, or um, Nikolai and Gwendolyn, could be a, a, a match. It's it's very, it's much harder in the books, especially going know, from I, Cersei to Brienne. I don't know. I, I think it can happen. I, I think that Jamie sees the beauty in her. I mean, he dreams of her being beautiful, and yes. I think that's how he's truly... I, I I mean, books are a funny thing because you have this description from of Brienne from so many different uh, point of views. And mm -hmm. yeah, it sounds like she's absolutely hideous. But like by today's standards, like what if she really isn't yeah. that hideous? Like what if she's just tall and kind of masculine and actually maybe <laughs> does look kind of like more of a young Gwendolyn Christie, but it's just that... Westerosi society just can't recognize that as beauty. And I, I don't know. The thing is, is that I, I think that people really are beautiful mm -hmm. once if, if they are beautiful inside. I, I really, it sounds cheesy, but I really believe that. And what is the attraction I'm Jamie hoping, has? I'm hoping that George isn't like, you know, they could have sex, but I don't think that Jamie would because Brienne is just too ugly. Especially after having her face <laughs> bitten off. <laughs> she 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 is not doing great at the end of a feast for crows with the um biter biting her face off, not yeah. doing good. No, no. But hey, Jamie lost his hand, so it's true. I mean, I, I know like a hand is different from half of your face, but mm. yeah. Uh, Courtney Maza makes a good point. Once you get to know someone, they become beautiful. Yeah, they do. Brienne will probably always be beautiful to Jamie in his mind. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, they get down to actually following through on that but you never know um it'd be the, nice being on the king's guard who knows it better not be a bullshit sex scene though that's all i'm saying it better not be gross like oh it will be gross because george r. <laughs> r martin's writing it oh man like it, it, it i wanted to be more like john and egret than you know the the, the standard mirror swamp thing <laughs> fat pink mast <laughs> Mess. Please no description of genitalia. Just just fade to black. Just Dario fade to black. taking Daenerys in every way a man can, knocking on that old back door. Oh my. Forgot about that one. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> one of my favorites of George's descriptions of sex. Awful, oh, I'm sure. Awful. Uh, <laughs> so I think this is, uh, we have a few questions here. Uh, you guys watching in the chat, this is the time. Start. Um, Start throwing questions at us. Uh, we're not going to probably go for that much longer. Um, if you want to make sure that your question gets answered, you can send in a super chat, um, all that other kind of stuff. Oh, Sam, uh, kind of cool sometimes is here. Hey, Sam. I didn't see you there in the chat. Um, so our first one was, uh, we alluded to this earlier. Uh, Stephen Stark, uh, one of my patrons, asked, Brienne is renowned for her morality and dedication. What are some instances of her not living up to her own ideal? I'm not trying to get you to speak badly about her. Yes, you are, Stephen. How dare you? Good characters making bad decisions makes them relatable. Brienne is a paragon of virtue in Westeros, but she's not perfect. Okay, so what moments did Brienne falter? Where did she it's, not do all that was good? It's hard. And the only one I can think of is something that um, someone said way earlier in the chat might have been Don Ward who said this, but I was thinking it as well as I was rereading chapters when she kills Shagwell and is like stabbing him over and over again and mm -hmm. telling him to laugh. <laughs> and um, because he was like taunting her and she's telling him to laugh as she's stabbing him to death and she's crying as she does it. Like she's killing him. Mm -hmm. she, she's stabbing him after he's dead. 
And that's, that's like most dark Brienne, the most dark Brienne that I, I see mm-hmm. in, in the books. The, um, I don't know, mostly, I, I don't see like Brienne doing bad things. She just has times of extreme naivety where I'm like almost rolling my eyes, <laughs> like especially in the beginning when um, Catalan says, you know, winter is coming even mm-hmm. for the night of summer. And Brienne says something like, oh, for, for us, it'll always be summer in the songs. People will sing about our legendary feats and we will we will never die in the songs. And she like truly believes it. And she truly believes kind of like Sansa that life is a song for um, her, even in her path to knighthood. And in Feast, she learns that definitely isn't the case. So I feel like her whole feast arc isn't really it is is really her experience of knighthood not being as perfect as she thought it was, kind of like Sansa's experience um, in uh, well throughout the books is that life isn't as perfect as she thought it was in the songs, and it's her her bad moments aren't really evil things that she does. It's it's just more. Um, misconceptions that she has about the world and learning that the world is something darker than it was. Mm -hmm. Uh, But her darkest moment personally, I think is when she's stabbing Shagwell beyond the point of death. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The most of her things, bad things that happen to her are decisions that don't turn out, but are made for good reasons. There aren't too many things where she's like deliberately doing e- something she can her- she considers immoral. Like there's no moment of her like shoving Bran out of the tower or anything like that. Where it's not it's not a dark thing. It's just things don't work out for her. Like like I said earlier, Nimble Dick, his death was avoidable, but it's not like she was wrong to distrust him because of the, the world she lives in. It's like it just didn't work out the way she wanted. You know what I mean? Mhm. Yeah. Definitely. So Brian is perfect. How dare you, Stephen, question her honor? <laughs> Come on, man. She's perfect. She's perfect. Okay. Although I guess the closest would be um, what she's going to do with uh, upcoming, like we were talking mm-hmm. about, Jamie and Lady Stoneheart. That will probably be ooh, another dark choice, no matter yeah. what she chooses to do. Maybe we get to see her darkest deed. Yeah, it's, maybe it's uh, set to come. Ah, okay. We got something here from Jay Moray. He says, Selwyn is Dunk and Daella's son. Maybe that Targaryen blood we were talking about. Dunk had a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of his kids was with Daella Targaryen. I don't know if we know that Dunk had a lot. I mean, we know that he had kids. He had a lot of kids. Yeah, yeah, because Hodor, we suspect, has Dunk lineage. Yes. Yeah, more than suspect. Mm -hmm. More than suspect. Um, (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, I think that Dunk is more likely to be Selwyn's grandfather just because timeline and stuff. Um, I forget like the exact mm-hmm. dates that we would consider, but um, yeah, I think that Selwyn is just more likely to be uh, Dunk's grandson. And I'm, I'm not sure, like there could be Targaryen ancestry on um, Selwyn's side, but I... I have a theory that I have some tinfoil mm-hmm. that I mean, I, I would kind of like this to be true. I, I still kind of like the idea that Dunk and Rowan banged eventually, whether it was, <laughs> um, whether it was in the tale where we meet Rowan or later on and that, that um, produced the line, which was Brienne's father or something like that. And, I like that just because I love Rowan <laughs> and I love that. I don't know. Maybe it's kind of weird, but I almost kind of love that Brienne and Jamie would be distant relatives to Rowan just because she's amazing. Also, she has freckles. Wait a second. Has- Wait a second. Are you saying that you don't think that Duncan <laughs> Rohan got down in that? I uh- do. Oh, okay. wait, that I don't think they got down. I mean, it's. Uh, he did they, not just cut might- off her braid. Okay. <laughs> or he might've saved it as a, Hey, this is, until I come back for you. 
<laughs> yeah, totally normal thing. But okay, so I also have this other theory for the Targaryen connection. I I really like to think that Small Dunk, um, Prince mm-hmm. of Dragonflies, son of um, Aegon the Fifth, mm-hmm. Egg, Dunk's Egg, um, and Jenny. So Small Dunk and Jenny had a daughter that we don't know about. Okay, and she survived. This is totally fanfic right now, by the way. And she Perfect. survived Summer Hall and um, was maybe sent to Tarth and was and, and then married Selwyn. I, I really like that because then you would have like a dunk in the tall and an egg connection. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I don't know. I just think it's like really sweet to think that small dunk and Jenny had a child and that that's relevant in some minor minor part to the main story now um also because if there is a targaryen connection in the tarth lineage especially a recent targaryen connection Mm -hmm. then it would make sense for it to be some offspring of a targaryen who uh doesn't you know have any claim any right to the throne which small dunk gave up his birthright so Mm. thanks everybody for listening to my tinfoil it's not canon in any way i just kind of want it to happen and i can't I mean, wait for fire and Fly volume two or volume three or whatever when we have volume... more details about summer hall oh my god small duncan jenny on I love- brand i do like the idea though that um dunk um ended up having a kid with um one of Aegon's sisters and that like nobody knew it was his kid and that's how you ended up with brienne i mean that that would be fine for me like dunk has a history of um getting down with ladies he he shouldn't especially his ancestor lucamore or mm. his theorized ancestor but he's definitely definitely is mm. that's definitely true okay yeah, there's it's, so many options for dunk he's yeah. dunk the hunk you know <laughs> yeah thick as a castle wall as they say <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh so yeah a good idea jay moray i like that one i i would like to see somebody write that theory how Dunk went from Daela Targaryen to Brienne. That'd be awesome. Uh, super <laughs> chat here from Aaron M., uh, one of my patrons. Thanks again, uh, Aaron. She says, thanks, guys. Great job. What is your ideal ending for Brienne? Oh, <laughs> Shakes has an ideal one. Not what you think will happen, but your ideal. Shakes, why don't you tell me what your ideal ending for Brienne is? Like it's not written I down am... somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, my ideal is that Brienne and jamie go back to tarth and get married and live happily ever ever Mm -hmm. happily ever after and brienne is the avon star and they have kids and jamie is a house husband and (laughs) that's my ideal the thing is is that would i actually like to see that published i'm not sure i don't Mm. think i would um i what would i actually like to see published and is that different than my ideal hmm like what is my published ideal i guess see this is the thing like i don't really think about what my ideal endings would be just because they're probably not going to be right and then i'll be really stuck on what my ideal ending was and be upset Mm -hmm. so i I don't really think about stuff like that my ideal ending for brienne is that she's alive (laughs) alive and happy that would be unique in a martin story (laughs) i mean i'm not even going for happy here just Mm -hmm. content just content um I would like Brienne to end up being knighted by Jamie. I think that part, like that scene from the show was absolutely perfect. I would love to see George write his version of that, especially from Brienne's perspective. That would be something. Um, I don't, I think I would like for her to um, continue the house strong ways and end up with a bastard child of Jamie that she'll never say, oh my God. say who the father is okay okay and everyone's yeah. everyone suspects and everyone thinks it's jamie but she'll never say it and that and ends she up... can still be a knight of the king's guard and a single mom mm-hmm. single mom <laughs> she can single mom brienne um and... this is a new way for women in westeros holding yeah. down a career and taking care of a kid hashtag rhaenyra of tarth <laughs> oh man <laughs> I, yeah, I would like for her and Jamie to end up hooking up and then have a kid of some kind. I think that would be nice for her. Um, we, we all make fun of it, but we all secretly want it. <laughs> it's true. Um, a super chat here from Frank B. Wow, his questions about Stannis. 
I would never have thought Frank Bum would ask about Stannis. So he says, <laughs> do you see Brienne encountering Stannis as she does in the show or have her thoughts moving to who, uh, Jamie instead of Renly and no one remembers, no one cares where Gurm's going for that aspect. Great stream roll. Thanks, Frank. Um, I appreciate the compliment. So he's referencing that in the show, um, if some of you haven't, uh, watched it which maybe some of you haven't brienne ends up killing stannis after the battle of ice as revenge for renly um it's definitely something on brienne's mind but it, it kind of hasn't come up for a while that was sort of her right after renly died and um she was uh joining catelyn she was all revved up about getting revenge on stannis hunting him down avenging renly and that's kind of gone to the wayside like we were talking about earlier how even her choice to help the orphans at the and at the crossroads is sort of abandoning her quest in a way for Sansa and Arya. She has really gone away from like getting back at Stannis mm -hmm. for what he did to her beloved Renly. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that we're going to see anything like that in the books. I mean, the way that Jamie is taking the place of Renly, I think, is is really symbolic in many ways. And I mean, it's not like she's going to forget about Renly mm -hmm. and the whole, uh, I don't know, like, could you say it was an oath that she made to herself to get revenge? I, I don't re quite remember, but I think that she's going to come up against a similar struggle when she takes Jamie to Lady Stoneheart. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know <laughs> what she has planned for that, um, but I don't think that she's going to let Lady Stoneheart kill Jamie. I mean, she's basically like Lady Stoneheart is in this supernatural shadow baby position. <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I can see like a really strong parallel there. And I don't think that Brienne is going to let the supernatural thing kill her beloved <laughs> again with the face of somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Well, parallels between Lady Stoneheart and uh, shadow baby. Interesting. Um, but I, I think that she's going to take her revenge in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I still stick with Brienne kills Lady Stoneheart. And I think that that'll resolve her desire. Issues with Stannis. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Since Jamie is kind of taking the place of, of Renly in her mind and in her dreams. True. It's um the show really, they didn't know what to do with Brienne for about two seasons. And they just kind of had her go north and then hunt Stannis. And then she's like watching a window with a candle. It was, it, it wasn't, it wasn't great. Yeah, it wasn't I, I, the best. I, <laughs> George will have better ideas for her. I don't think there's much of a chance that Brienne post Stoneheart is going to say, you know what I need to do now? Stannis Baratheon. That guy needs to die. I need to go find I mean, him in the north. He's dead to me. I, I don't think that's going to happen. It was fine in the show because it was a thread that they kept going throughout mm -hmm. the seasons. Like she kept bringing it up that she's going to get her vengeance um, in the show, that is. If it comes and up, I think she will. Yeah, and I mean, in, yeah, season five, all that time that she was staring at the candle, <laughs> waiting for it to be lit in the window. Yeah, that was kind of just <laughs> waiting around for something to happen. But I'm not like totally dissatisfied with her arc and getting revenge against Stannis. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not totally against how everything happened regarding Stannis in the show. I know it wasn't how he is in the books, but the adaptation worked for me and it was like, I don't know. It uh, was at least consistent and mm -hmm. it was fine. I liked it, but I think that we're, just, I, I think that we just have more rich stuff in store for us in the books. Yeah. I think George will do more with, uh, with Brienne than just having her be an executioner for Stannis after her book. If it happens, mm -hmm. it will be much, much better than, than that. Although it was <laughs> some satisfaction there. Uh, another super chat from Ross Tremblay, uh, 20, uh, dollars with an A in front of it. Not sure what that means. Uh, what do you guys think about her mental health with conflating Renly and Jamie and her memories? Is there any events in her story that is complete fantasy because of POV? This is actually a good question because people have pointed out um, at the end of the battle at the in at the crossroads, um, she sees um, Biter's tongue, but it's it's actually like a spear or something like that. Like. Yeah, there, there, she does see things sometimes that aren't there. Most, I mean, that it's a heat of battle thing, but mm -hmm. I think we can, we can, we know that what she felt about Renly was at some level fiction. 
like her own little fan fiction thing where even if Loris is lying a lot, some element is true that Renly had no intention of taking Brynn to wife and being and loving her, that if he was doing anything, he was having pity and sympathy, not a romantic relationship. So I think that's that's a good question to ask. How much is Brienne making up in her head and how much is there? I think she's pretty grounded, to tell mm-hmm. you the truth. Like, she's one of the most grounded characters that I can think of. She's constantly, as she's meeting people in her story, she's um, doing this sort of checks and balances thing in her head where she's considering how trustworthy they can be. And the reader is doing the same thing. I feel like we're getting a pretty solid narration of events through her point of view. And she's her her past is unfolding <laughs> throughout her chapters. And we get more insight into um, like her background. And it, it seems like she's constantly thinking of things from her past and recalling memories to kind of ground her, <laughs> ground herself. And when when like biter gets to her as uh, max said in the chat she was pretty feverish after he took that hunk of flesh out of yeah. her cheek like his tongue as a sword that's after he's bitten <laughs> half her mouth. so i i think that i would probably be hallucinating from pain a little bit there too. Fair. i can't imagine what it feels like and as far as her mixing up jamie and renly in her mind like i know that she like dreams that Jamie is Renly putting a cloak around her shoulders. And I mean, you know, I dream freaky shit too. I mean, (laughs) personal, but you know, it happens and people look different in dreams. So I don't think that we should say that her dreams are any evidence of her uh, failing mental health because people do have some wild trippy dreams in A Song of Ice and Fire. Really Um, true. Jamie in particular. Yeah, yeah. I think she's very observant and she very she also um is very aware of the thoughts that she's having, maybe not necessarily all of her feelings because she tends to push away feelings of love mm-hmm. <laughs> for like Jamie. Like she she kind of accepted her love for Renly maybe because it was kind of safe because she knew she couldn't be with him, but mm. It's like every time she thinks of Jamie, she kind of pushes that away. Maybe because it's something that she really wants. <laughs> oh, she wants it. I think she can have it, but she might be able to have it. Maybe. <laughs> Here's hoping. Uh, yeah. So grab another question here. Um, Rod Dammit says, do we think uh, Brienne will be Lord Commander of the Kingsguard like Dunk and finish Jamie's pages with this heroic feats near the end? So sort of... Um, that that's one of those things that it's kind of hard to parse because we know Dunk's story and where it ends with him at Summerhall, but he does become Lord Commander of the King's Guard for for Egg. Does that mean Brienne will do the exact same thing, or will George do a take on it? Because Brienne's really a take on Dunk. Mm-hmm. Like they're very similar characters, just sort of started off in different. Uh, starting positions in the world where Dunk starts off poor, Brienne starts off a woman and um, a lord, but they're Mm -hmm. like sort of the same basic characters at their core. So do you think that do you think that's foreshadowing? Is Will Brienne do what she does in the show and end up in the same position as Dunk? I also like thinking of Brienne as possibly Queensguard for Sansa. Uh, I think that that Mm -hmm. would be really nice and just more appropriate for her goals right now, which are to protect um, or keep, keep her oath to Catalan and protect Sansa, <clears throat> even though she's never met her. And like I said earlier, I think that her, her quest for Sansa is in a big part, a quest for herself and having her guardian Sansa at the end would be just like a really nice resolution hmm. of all those goals. So Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe her own version. I mean, like, Dunk only serves Egg not because he's king of Westeros, because they're friends. Mm-hmm. So I definitely think that Brienne survives. Brienne survives. <laughs> Some people, like, think that Brienne is expendable. <gasps> and I remember like, before, see, before uh, the Long Night episode, episode three of season eight, people were like, Brienne's head is on the chopping block. She's totally going. She's gone. And I was like one of the only people on Twitter saying, 
hell no, <laughs> she survived. <laughs> And everybody was so shocked. Well, people were shocked for a lot of reasons. I Quite guess. a lot of reasons, yeah. But I maintain faith for my girl Brienne the whole way through. And mm. she survived. And I will do so in the books. There you go. <laughs> Hope Springs Eternal with Brienne. Uh, Carl Karsnark, he has a sort of a similar question where is Brienne destined to die in Night's Death? I think this is, I mean, those are kind of two separate questions where Dunk did become Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, but then he also died in Summerhall. And mm. it seems to be a, kind of a tragic end. She's, I mean, the no chance or no choice moment, Dunk may have thought the same thing when he apparently saved everybody at Summerhall. It seems like at some level, Brienne is suicidally, well, maybe not suicidally, but very willing to put her life on the line for things she cares about. So much like Dunk, there, who constantly put himself in danger and escaped until he finally couldn't when the, mm -hmm. we got involved with Targaryens and magic and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that is where the story's going. It's not, mm -hmm. un, it's not unreasonable that Brienne ends up the same way, even though both of us expressed we definitely don't want Summer Hall for Brienne. Well, everybody's got to die at some point. I mean, that's like... <laughs> Brienne, um, excuse me, the undying disagree. Okay, yeah. And maybe Blood Raven too. Maybe Blood but, Raven. Yeah. But, I mean, the thing is that I feel like for this story, it's really important that we have good things that survive. And I feel like Brienne is just this emblem of pure knighthood and good in the world. Um, there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like having Brienne die at the end of, yeah, it would be like having um, Sam die at the end of Lord of the Rings. Or, yeah. um, you know, I, I just feel like she's one of those characters that has to make it through to the end to be like, you know, see, this is, this is what survives when everything else is lost. I mean, she will die eventually, but I feel like not in, not within the, um, covers of this story. I mean, of course, she would die doing something valiant like Dunk would, but mm -hmm. I just don't see it happening. I, I hope it doesn't. Happen. I, I don't. I mean, there are a lot of things I don't see happening as far as this story goes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Mostly you're growing with Brienne. No pretty Maris. Everything goes I, great. I'm going to say something more along the lines of a dream of spring. But I don't know. Yeah, see if that ever happens. Uh, good question here from uh, Courtney Maza. She says, have you all heard Shakes' take on Jenny's song? Because it's heaven. How, how many in the chat have heard Shakes's? I think we need to drop that link in the chat. Uh, let me see if I can grab that for everybody. It was really good. Um, you you recorded a shorter version for the video I put out, but then made a longer version you put out on SoundCloud, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And some people have asked me to like put it on iTunes, and I'm still figuring out how to do that at some point. So I will um, let you guys know. But you can see it on SoundCloud. I'm trying you have to get the... the link. Okay. Um, do you have it? That, I'll try to drop it in. I will search for it on the Twitters. Let's see. Anyway, great question, Courtney. If you haven't listened to it, you definitely should. Did an excellent, excellent job. Um, Thanks. <laughs> that was a funny night because I was like, Jakes, I know this is last minute. Can you make a recording of Jenny's song? Oh, yeah, sure. What? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, and I did like just a clip for you. Mm -hmm. um, just the, I wanted but, specific lines. But then Radio Westeros wanted me to do a full version like people were asking me, have you done the full version yet? Have you done a full version yet? And I was like, no, not yet. But then um, uh, Lady Guinevere from Radio Westeros was like, hey, I'd really like a full version so I can put it on my podcast. <laughs> <I'm> like, Shit! <laughs> <laughs> and so sometimes you just need a little bit of motivation. <laughs> and Radio Westeros asking you to do yeah. things. <laughs> right. Um, so, Yeah. Or were we here? Make sure you listen to that. Um, we'll just grab a, a couple more because my voice is starting to go too. Mm. Yeah, getting. And I got plants to take care of. I got mm. I got gardening to do. I don't know if you guys saw on Twitter. I germinated some seeds. The seeds are strong, you guys. <laughs> the seeds are strong. My broccoli's growing so far. <laughs> that was apparently that was the fastest one to germinate of the ones I planted. Mm. Very nice. Um, I'll probably I might make videos about that. I don't know. 
it's kind of a weird thing it doesn't really connect with the song of ice and fire but it's sure it does you can make anything connect with i'll the just song talk about the tyrells fire. while doing it <laughs> so this week we'll talk about loris tyrell while i prune some tomatoes <laughs> cool does anybody else have any questions uh guilty undertaker says dunk sacrifice himself to save baby rhaegar at summer hall Will Brienne do something similar? It doesn't. There's not too many babies left. Um, there's not too many people, kind of, sort of, in that position of important children. Mm -hmm. At the end yeah. of the Dance of Dragons. I mean, honestly, we haven't seen a lot of babies birthed in a Song of Ice and Fire. I think we've. I think more have died than we've seen been born. Um, I don't know. It's. I mean, it, essentially, Dunk is like saving a child, and that's what Brienne is always doing mm -hmm. uh not even in her quest for uh sansa but taking pod under her wing um, yeah i mean she definitely i can definitely see her saving a baby i'm not just i'm just not sure whose it would be <laughs> like there's nobody trying to hatch dragons anymore so that was the yeah. whole point of summer hall so somebody would have to get pregnant brienne would have to be in position of importance to that person and then them be in danger so yeah even though brienne has all these uh narrative similarities with dunk i don't think that it's going to be a beat for beat uh parallel like i i think that they have more in common character wise than than they will end up having story wise mm -hmm. uh, so i think there's a lot of flexibility for her to have her have her own story that doesn't necessarily look like everything that dunk did but i i absolutely agree she she's like dunk in that she saves young innocent weak uh people and children so i could see her doing it mm -hmm. oh uh ross temby uh he chimed in to clarify his question uh the a stands for aussie oh from australia um Apparently, I'm messing with everybody with time zones today. Um, she, she, uh, he says she remembers Jamie granting her a rainbow cloak on the trip to Clack Clack, Clack Crack Clock Point. I don't remember that part. Is, no, uh, that was a dream that Brian had oh, okay. about um, Jamie fastening a rainbow cloak okay. around her shoulders. Like it was really Renly, but that's just another example of her imagining Jamie in the place of Renly because, you know, he's her new love interest. <laughs> another man that she po cannot possibly have a relationship with like jamie is not only locked behind cersei and the kids he already has but literally being a king's guard impossible mm -hmm. briad why do you shoot for the impossible but again it's like jamie taking renly's place and maybe it's also a subtle way to communicate hey brienne's not going to have this quest for revenge um against stannis anymore mm -hmm. and she's going to be more connected to Jamie now than she is to Renly and his his ghost in in her mind. You know, for a guy that everyone hates in Renly, he seems to keep coming up quite a lot. Just like random plots, random characters. It's like he dies mm -hmm. sort of unceremoniously at Storm's End and he kind of like Ned in a way, he just keeps echoing throughout the story. It's kind of weird how George is doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I hope that, yeah, it, it's it's different in the books for sure than it is in the show. Yeah, Renly's forgotten about in the show entirely. And really <laughs> about it again, and how Lady Catelyn dies in the show, and we just rarely hear about her again. And I'm like, that's probably not going to happen in the books. And I'm like, of course it doesn't happen in the books. We have Lady Stoneheart. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, that's the great thing about books. It's a totally different medium. It's true. Much, much more dense. You could not do Brands of Feast for Crows journey on show, pretty much. I feel like It'd be could. so it would hard. Be yeah. it, and the thing is, is that I feel like if you translated everything as it was in the book to the show, it would, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be that great. No. <laughs> I feel like, like, as far as for the medium, like it would be great for a book reader who just wants to see a visualization exact to the way that the books are. But um, I don't know. I'm a lot softer on the show for some of the liberties that mm -hmm. they took. Not for all of them, but for some of the liberties they took just for some to of them. communicate <laughs> a story in that visual medium. 
Okay. Uh, just take... Or like Jay Murray says, uh, Brienne's story would work well animated. I can really see that. Mm. Kind of like the animated Hobbit. I, I can see that for uh, Brienne's story. If it was only just Brienne, if you just had her. Mm -hmm. I think that's part okay. of the problem is uh, people... Well, I talked about at the beginning, part of the problem that people have with their POV and A Feast for Crows in general is it's such a different tone versus the other books, which are much more the High Lords games and they're kind of more action-y and high fantasy. And then you go back to Brienne and she's pulling a dunk. Now, I love Dunk and Egg. I love those stories, but they are very different from like Daenerys trying to rule Marine. Those are very different styles and narratives. So it's kind of a change of pace that not everybody appreciates, I guess. Uh, so just a couple more. Uh, Rod Dammit has another one. He says, what's going to happen when Bran brings Jamie to Lady Stoneheart? Does she bring Jamie to Stoneheart? Well, yes, she does. Uh, we see in A Dance with Dragons that uh, Jamie sees Brienne, and obviously she has not been hanged, and she's trying to lead her somewhere. I mean, he's, she's trying to lead him somewhere. So they are going to meet. It's a good question, um, because it's not. it doesn't appear that Brienne was sent... I, was sent with people like monitoring her mm -hmm. like is is somebody gonna be watching with like a bow like thomas seven sitting there like making sure that she doesn't tell jamie what's about to happen i assume that she'll try and help him because she doesn't want yeah. him to die and she's pretty unhappy with lady stoneheart at this point as i've been saying i think what's going to happen is that brianna is going to kill lady stoneheart and whether she plans to do that now or whether it's a decision that she makes when she's there um, I, I don't think she's going to stand by and watch Lady Stone, Stoneheart kill Jamie. And I think that Jamie's going to have to um, help Brienne kind of heal from that trauma because it's going to be really <laughs> traumatic. And he's the perfect one to do that since he had to kill somebody that he swore an oath to. Um, yeah, it'll that be would, really interesting. That'd be sure. hard for both of them. Both of them have sworn vows to Cattle and yeah, Stark. Yeah, but you know, Jamie's kind of done it before and at a really big level, like swearing to protect the king and then killing him so <laughs> yeah Ma and mad king Eris and mad queen catelyn mm -hmm. sort of seems similar um and it's, it's true what uh carl karsnark said brienne killing lsh would be a mercy killing for cat as much as anything and she would have to come to terms with that and learn to see it as a mercy killing i mean it's, it's no way you can let lady stoneheart live and the world is a good place <laughs> The interesting thing that's going to happen, though, is that obviously Jamie has lost his hand. He's a terrible swordsman now. He really can't do anything. So w would Stoneheart put him in a situation for a trial by combat like she did with the Hound? Or would she just, oh no, no like happened with the Hound with Beric, give him a chance? Or is she just going to string Jamie up like she did with Podrick, Heil, and Brienne? Her style I don't think she'll do the same thing twice. I think she'll hmm. do something different. Have something special for Jamie Lannister. Yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll be something like really poetic and uh, morbid. I'm sure. I haven't thought of it yet, though. Like I said, I don't really think these things out too far in advance <laughs> because I want to be surprised. <laughs> but um, yeah, Ugh. so much, so much gruesomeness in store for us in Two Wow. I'm sure. I don't. I don't really want to read that chapter when it comes up. Like I just, do. I'll tell you about it. Thank you. It'll just be you painful. I'm going to be reading them. Like, oh no, 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 no. As whatever horrible thing Lady Stoneheart has in has in uh, store for Jamie Lannister and Brienne. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and Aaron M says it would be a chance for Brienne to save. Oh. Jamie. They, he's, the same way he saved her in the bear pit. So, yeah. I, I think this is how it's got to go down for sure. Mm -hmm. Dan saves Jamie by killing Stoneheart, and then it's like, it's like her saving him in the way that he saved her from the bear pit, and then it's also like her killing Stoneheart in the way that he killed Ares, and it, it's just like one perfect. It, it's how it has to happen. It, ha it has to happen that way. It would actually be interesting if, um, like Brienne was kind of set free afterwards after delivering Jamie in a similar way where Jamie was told to leave Heron Hall, or he did leave Heron Hall. And what if Brienne left and came back and then he repeated the line back and then holds Jamie and says, I dreamed of you. That's why I came back. Mm, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Just a moment. Okay. All right, I'm good. Yeah, so that would be nice. <laughs> Write that fanfic, guys. 
Um, so I think that's just about it for us. Um, I've got stuff to do. It's very early in the morning for shakes, although no, not anymore anymore. <laughs> well, instead of the, the yard arm now, and I'm having some uh, champagne. <laughs> so oh, that's champagne. Okay. I thought you were just drinking like a flower glass. I'm like, all right, shakes is doing weird stuff today. <laughs> oh, no, this is a, uh, this is a, a glass, like a drinking glass. Oh, okay. Drinking the champagne, fanning yourself, <laughs> thinking about Jamie and Brienne hooking up. Oh, yes. The vapors. You guys send it right to <laughs> at Shakes of Thrones on right, Twitter. Right to <laughs> right her. My yeah, and um, right my veins. Th of course, that's where you can find Shakes on uh, on Twitter, Shakes of Thrones. Her blog, um, it's shakespeareofthrones.com, right? Mm hmm. Uh, find her essays. Um, we linked in the chat earlier her awesome rendition of Jenny's song. Um, Thanks so much for joining me. It's been wonderful talking about our our best Brienne, it's been the best amazing. character. I had a great time. This is <laughs> awesome to spend a Saturday anytime. <laughs> <laughs> and for um, uh, for me, obviously, um, follow me on Twitter at the Joe Magician. Like, subscribe, all the things out here on YouTube. Um, you can follow me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Joe Magician. Sign up to get stuff early, access to the Patreon Slack, which Shakes is a part of. She's in there. Oh, yeah. I'm in there. She's in there. <laughs> I should say hi. I'll post pictures of my herbs that I'm growing. Excellent. We actually we have a new channel for that, Growing Strong channel for gardening. Oh, cool. Okay, I'll definitely come in. There we hi. go. Um, and, you know, get access to things early, patron-only episodes. And remember, tomorrow, tomorrow for everybody, my new video about Arya and her coin and Jack and the Faceless Men will be going live. Um, I'll put it out on Twitter. I think I'll do it as a premiere too, so we can all watch it together. This is a short one though, only about 13 minutes. Not my 45 minute diatribes about Brandon Stark hooking up with everybody in Westeros. This is a short one. <laughs> Little one. Uh, so thanks again, everybody. Uh, got up around 120, 130 people I saw. Um, great way to spend a Saturday. I'll see you guys next Saturday. Probably to talk some Arya and Faceless Men. Goodbye. Cool. Bye, everyone.